Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the May 2nd, 2017 Planning Commission meeting for the City of Vista. Commissioner Looney, will you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ms. Turley, will you call the roll? Commissioner Carroll is absent. Chairman Kramer? Here. Commissioner Bell? Here. Commissioner Gerritsen? Here. Commissioner Jekyll? Here. Commissioner Rosler? Here. Commissioner Looney? Here. Student Commissioner Agueda is absent, as is Student Commissioner Cranford. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, before you are the minutes from the April 18th, 2007 um, Planning Commission meeting. If there are any changes, um, please introduce them now. If not, will someone make a, me a motion to accept them? Commissioner Rossler. I move to accept the minutes as presented. Commissioner Gerritsen. I second the motion. Thank you. Commissioners, please vote. Please let the record show that the minutes are accepted as original, as prepared with uh, Commissioner Carroll being absent and Chairman Kramer abstaining. Thank you. Ms. Chow, are there any agenda changes for this evening's meeting? Good evening, Chairman Kramer. No changes tonight. Thank you. Before we begin our regularly scheduled meeting and get on with the two items that are on this evening's agenda, now is an opportunity for anyone in the public who wishes to speak on anything that is not on this evening's agenda. So if you, I don't have any speaker slips, but if that is something that you came here to do is to talk on something else, just fill out a speaker slip or wave your hand and you can come up and talk and then we'll fill out the paperwork later. Okay, seeing none. Um, Ms. Chow, would you like to lead us please in the first public hearing item, 6P16-0154, The Grove, Wakeland Housing, please. Certainly, thank you, Chairman Kramer. Good evening, Chairman Kramer, Planning Commissioners. I'm Patsy Chow, I'm the City Planner, Deputy Director of Community Development Department. I'm here this evening to present the first public hearing item which is a request for a site development plan for the Grove, which is a senior affordable housing project that's being proposed by Wakeland Housing. So the proposed project is to be located on a 2.01 acre parcel, and that will be to develop 80 affordable apartment units for seniors, which will be at the age of 62 plus, and also be providing a one manager unit, which will be a two bedroom unit, all of that will be at the proposed density of 40.3 dwelling units per acre. There will be 66 one-bedroom units proposed, uh, 15 two-bedroom units uh, with parking areas, uh, associated drainage improvements, wet and dry utilities, all of the associated infrastructure for the project, private common driveway, as well as common open space and amenities in the form of community garden with raised beds, lounge areas, uh, there will also be a bocce ball court area, game tables, uh, built-in barbecue, and as well as private balconies for the units. On this aerial photo, the subject site is depicted in outlined in red in the center of the picture. It is surrounded by residential uses as well as commercial uses. And it is a site that is zoned South Gateway District in the downtown specific plan area and the density there identified for this area is at 30 dwelling units per acre. The general plan designation is mixed use, and that is also at 30 dwelling units per acre. This is just a view of the project site from Civic Center Drive, and the, uh, the existing site is basically uh, comprised of a 
30 multifamily complex, which was originally developed as a motel in the 50s. And here's the site plan of the proposed project. I just wanted to note the uh, common usable open space areas in the middle that's kind of somewhat surrounded by the building, and you have the center area, which is basically where the community garden is. You have the lounge areas, the bocce ball court, game tables, etc. And then you have the parking uh, around the perimeter of the site. In terms of the general plan and development standards, um, as mentioned before, it is zoned mixed use at 30 dwelling units per acre. That would allow a uh, maximum of 60 dwelling units based on the 30 dwelling units per acre density. But however, the applicant has requested a density bonus for this project, knowing that this is a 99% affordable housing project uh, where 80 of the units would be uh, affordable to uh, seniors. And so with a density bonus of a 35%, uh, they would be able to then achieve 81 dwelling units maximum that would be allowed on the site. The density at 81 units would then be 40.3 dwelling units per acre. The Southgate District, as mentioned before uh, as well, it's at 30 dwelling units per acre, but with a 35% density bonus, that would uh, achieve, then it would be uh, at 40. 0.5 dwelling units per acre. So then the proposed 81 units would be just below that. The building height identified in the downtown specific plan has a maximum allowed height of 45 feet. The project with a three story building is just under 44 feet, so it's meeting the height requirement. In terms of the setbacks, the front yard is required at 15 feet, and the rear is at 15 feet as well. The density bonus in our ordinance uh, in the City of Vista Code allows for the applicant to request land use concessions in addition to the 35% density bonus. In the particular case of a 35% request, they are able to request three land use concessions. So the first concession that they're asking is for the front yard setback to be reduced. Um, in, the, in the project's case, then the front yard setback would vary from six to eight feet from the ultimate right-of-way line, uh, since the project has to dedicate uh, 10 feet to the public right-of-way on Civic Center Drive. So from that ultimate right-of-way line, the setback would be about six to eight feet, varying between those two numbers. So that's the first concession. In terms of the parking, our code identifies a parking ratio for multifamily projects, which are basically applied for market rate projects. So on that alone, we would be looking at 115, 115 required parking spaces since we don't have a particular ratio for affordable projects. However, the state law allows affordable housing projects, specifically senior rental housing projects, and projects that are within a half mile of a major transit stop to ask for a reduced parking ratio, which would be at 0.5 spaces per unit. That would equate to 41 required spaces for this project. But as we know, uh, the project is actually proposing 81 parking spaces, so almost double the amount than what the state would require. Nonetheless, um, I've listed, and we've listed that as a land use concession because we technically don't have an affordable housing rate, parking ratio in our code. So, we're being conservative and we're including that as a land use concession. In terms of the open space, the project is required to provide 16,200 square feet of open space where they're providing 16,274 square feet. A portion of that, or 33% 33 33 of the 16,200 square feet would be required to be provided as private space. And the project is meeting that, um, and the amount is 5,771, which is above what's required at 33%. In terms of landscaping, they're also exceeding the required number, which is uh, they're providing 23% of the site as being landscaped, where 5% is uh, required. And the uh, last unit on this list here has to do with the unit sizes, which is the, the last and the third land use concession. Uh, as the code, the Vista Development Code requires one bedroom units to be at 700 square feet and the two bedroom units to be at 880 square feet. The uh, proposed one bedroom units in the project, they are 502. And the proposed, some of the proposed two bedrooms also vary in size from 753 to 843, 
which again is below the, the um, minimum required per our code. So that's the last land use concession. Here's a landscape plan that shows the 23% of the site being landscaped, which exceeds the 5% required. They have a use of uh, native and non-native plant materials throughout the site, which actually uh, would then uh, require low or moderate water use because obviously we're trying to be water efficient uh, with, the, with the landscaping and the uh, water use on the, as part of the project. The uh, proposed first floor plan has on the bottom right, it's the entry lobby area, and uh, just kind of proceeding from it, you have a community room uh, gathering with a kitchen. The manager's unit is also near the entry, or near the, close to the entry lobby area. There are laundry rooms um, on the first, second, and the third floor, and then you have the uh, distribution of one and two bedrooms throughout the floor. The second floor plan is pretty close, similar to the first floor plan, um, and the third, similar to the second, with less units, um, but nonetheless, the distribution of one and two bedrooms with the laundry rooms, um, generally in the same locations as the uh, below floors. In terms of the architectural elevations, I have on this slide the north elevation on the top, and then the, uh, the south elevation at the bottom. And on the right side of the south elevation is Civic Center Drive, basically. Um, the particular architectural style that we have here is a, kind of a unique craftsman style that has uh, an eclectic combination. of There's the traditional and contemporary elements that are being used. So you have stucco and composite wood cladding. You have uh, cement siding accents, uh, and the use of concrete tile and flat built-out roofs. Uh, we also have storefront glazing along at the lobby area and also vinyl windows that are being used at the units. The color is basically earth tone, light to dark browns with red cedar accents. And obviously the buildings would have to be constructed to meet the California Building Code um, at the time that the building plans are submitted for staff's review for permit approvals. So these are the other sides of the building, the west elevation on the top, and then the east elevation at the bottom, which is what one will be looking at from Civic Center Drive. In terms of environmental review, the project is actually covered under the program EIR that was prepared for downtown Vista specific plan. And so therefore the project is qualifying for an exemption under state CEQA guidelines because it meets the uh, particular conditions of the, uh, the exemptions as far as the, uh, the general plan, the size of the lot, and uh, particulars of traffic, noise, and air quality, and not resulting in significant effects related to those. We've added, nonetheless, conditions of approval related to some of the elements addressed in the EIR, and so they're included in the project. There was an early design review uh, meeting on December 15th, 2015, uh, where some of the items that were brought up have been addressed by the applicant. The first one has to do with the pavilion not providing a kitchen or dining room. The applicant since then has added a community room with a kitchen and a living room area, as well as an outdoor dining table and several lounge areas, et cetera, with game tables. Um, also, the amenities were uh, discussed during that meeting on December 15th, and uh, the addition of bocce ball court was appreciated at the time, so they, the applicant made sure to um, add other features to the project, uh, with such as the community garden, the game tables, and the outdoor dining area. There was also a question that was raised during that meeting about property management um, on the site, and there will be a manager on site that will be leaving on site, and there's and uh, identified the two bedroom unit for the manager and uh, that would be part of the project. In terms of the uh, policy considerations, the proposed density as mentioned before at 40.3 dwelling units per acre is below what the maximum will be allowed at 40.5 uh, with the understanding that they would be, um, that they're actually requesting a density bonus of a 35% on top of what they are allowed at 30 dwelling units per acre. And the project meets the requirements of the downtown specific plan and the design guidelines for multifamily projects and as well as the density bonus requirements. 
So staff's recommendation is for the approval of the site volume plan for the 80 affordable apartment units for, this, for seniors and a manager's unit on the 2.01 acre site located just west of Civic Center Drive in South Gateway, downtown specific plan area. I would also like to point out uh, that I provided the Planning Commission with a set of revised affordable housing conditions, which are items 34 through 36, and they basically provide more specificity and uh, in terms of the income limits that will be addressed uh, for the particular units um, in terms of their breakdown, and, and it also um, emphasizes the consistency with the regulatory agreement uh, that is stated under the DDA for this particular project. So we're just trying to make sure that the items are all consistent with each other. So this is just kind of bringing that in into the conditions of approval for the project. So I just wanted to mention that, that that's also part of the uh, staff's recommendation to replace the ones that were provided in the original staff report. And that concludes my presentation. I'm here to uh, answer any questions. And the applicant is also in the audience. With the uh, with consultants and uh, for any questions they may have, thank you very much. Ms. Chow, did the applicant desire to do a presentation or just answer questions? I don't believe they have a formal presentation, but they're definitely here to answer questions that you may have for them. Perfect. Thank you so much. Sure. Commissioner Rossler. Ms. Chow, the the concession for the bedroom size or the reduction in size. Uh, the code requirement is for any one-bedroom uh, unit. We don't specifically have a bedroom size for age-restricted or senior uh, apartments. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. It's not specific for senior projects versus other types. Yep. Okay. And then on the street right-of-way, um, in the cr one of the cross-sections, it showed the existing the existing right-of-way to remain, and then it also showed future curb and gutter and sidewalk. Is Civic Center going to be widened at some time in the future? Um, help me with that. So at some point in the future, yes, that would be what we're planning for. Uh, to meet the circulation element, the 10-foot dedication is being asked of this project, uh, but they are paying an in lieu fee, basically, that would cover uh, the future improvements to allow for the actual physical improvements, to allow for the sidewalk to be relocated. Uh, the landscaping would have to be, you know, redone at that point. But that is something into the future because uh, we wouldn't do this particular segment on its own, basically. Right. Yeah. The entire street would be done at one time. One would hope so. Okay. All right. Thank you. So with that said, uh, the, excuse me, the setbacks, are they affected or is that included in the, the um, dedication of the 10 feet? The, uh, the setbacks, with, once the dedication as part of the project and into the future when the improvements actually take place for the whitening, the setbacks will be as they are presented on the plans, which is the 6 to 8. Okay. So now the setbacks are obviously much greater. Uh, the building setback, yes, from, from the existing property line, yes, it is greater, but from the ultimate, which is what we're identifying because that will be what will eventually happen, okay. that's the six to eight. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Looney, please. Yeah, Patsy, is there a, a simple answer to the origin of the city's concessions on projects as this? The, the origin, of the, uh, origin and the beginning of the land use concessions, that really comes with the density bonus with the state law. Um, as far as which concessions we give to a particular project, that is, it comes from a request from the developer as to which ones they would like to you know, apply for. But if I understand your question correctly, as far as where it starts, it really starts at the at the state level. It's a state law requirement where they're allowed to ask for a certain amount of concessions based on the percentage uh, being affordable, um, the project being affordable. In this case, 35%. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Chow, the affordable housing for seniors, is that basically the same as the affordable housing requirements as they would be for anybody else? Uh, annual income, that kind of? Um, 
That's a good question. I, I, if you are asking in terms of um, what comes with it, as far as requirements, requirements. and how we look at it, um, I guess affordable is affordable, just okay. thinking in that sense, uh, whether they are uh, addressing seniors or other age groups. Um, at the end of the day, it's still an affordable housing project. There are certain concessions or in, in terms of like the state looking at it for parking. They specifically say 0.5 parking spaces per unit on a senior affordable housing project. So I guess from a state's perspective, there could be a differentiation between the age groups. Uh, but as I look at it from just overall being affordable, it's just, you know, it's an affordable housing project. Uh, commissioners, any other questions before we move on to public? Commissioner Jackal, please. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you. <coughs> um, this is really kind of silly, but I was looking at the different floor plans and um, sort of arranging furniture in my mind. And in unit C already has a kitchen table. Units A and B, I'm just wondering where a table for eating would go. B might, you might be able to put one just along the wall there. So as I say, it's not monumental, but just question just a comment not a question yeah okay thank you okay let's get started here uh, Susan McAllister oh I'm sorry uh, Commissioner Gerritsen then <coughs> Susan McAllister. yeah just a quick question on the uh, uh, the age does every resident have to be over 62 or does there just have to be one resident over 62 to, to uh, live here? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would imagine that at least one resident would have to be 62 plus, but I think that would be best answered by the applicant for accuracy. Okay. Uh, we do have some more other questions for the applicant. If one of you would like to come forward or... Please state your name and give your address, please. Thank you. Jack Ferris from Wakeland Housing, 1230 Columbia Street, San Diego. 62, the 62-year-old uh, year uh, requirement would be who's on the lease. Of course, a spouse could be younger. Um, that's that answer. Does, does that mean that if a person's on the lease at 62, they could have teenagers... So this no, could vary. Yeah. No, we're pretty particular on who's on the lease. It's for a senior community. So this couldn't turn into a one senior and you know two teenagers in the house or in the apartment. Or... That's correct. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Rossler. Um, has Wakeland uh, done? this type of housing project before? Have you got experience in senior housing projects? We have, well, yes, we have Pavley Villas, I think is the name. Um, that's a senior, and we've done thousands of units of affordable. We have two different, we are a developer, that's all we do. We're nonprofit. Our mission is affordable housing. We've been doing it for 18 years. Some of us have been in it for a lot longer than that. Okay. So yes, we have a vast, experience in it. Okay, very good. Um, you're out of San Diego. Would there be other projects in North County that we'd be familiar with that you've done? Or mostly in San Diego? It's mostly in San Diego. We have South Bay. Can you think of something? Oh, th thank you. Yes, we have one in Oceanside. Okay. Um, it's actually a turnaround, Zach Rehab, and the mayor came and spoke. He was a police officer when it was in a troubled state, and he was so happy that we turned everything around and completely redid the, the development there. Okay, 
All right. Um, the other question I had for you uh, concerns the grading. According to the staff report, there's over 5,000 cubic yards of uh, additional fill that you're going to be bringing into the site, and yet you've still got a, a downslope from the street right of way. Uh, I was just curious, why didn't you bring enough in to so you didn't have to have uh, retaining walls in the front? I mean, they're only a couple of feet in, in some cases, but. Uh, raising the entire site up so that you're at grade across the street frontage seemed to make a, a lot of sense to me. Well, the architect is here. I will say that the site view from the street, uh -huh. it, was, it was appreciated, I think, by the staff that we actually weren't elevated. You could go by and it was, it was there, but not a huge monument there. Okay. That, that's All right. Makes That's sense. probably so the best did, answer. You did that on purpose to, to lower to the not profile. go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, the only access to the common area uh, where the outdoor uh, facilities are is through the the uh, the dining area. Well, from the outside, that's a front. But if you're if you're in a residence. You can come out your front door, walk throughout the area. So if you live there, you can come right out your door and go to the inside area, the um, bocce ball, the gardens. Is that what your question was? Yeah, if you came out the front door of your unit, wouldn't you have to go down the hallway to that, that uh, entry area into the, uh, into the entire project and then go out through the, um, through the dining area? Did I, uh, if, I, if I'm reading the plans right? I'm going to let. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Jack Gallagher. I'm the project architect with Dahlin Group Architects. We're located at 539 South Cedros Avenue in Solano Beach. Uh, I'm trying to recall myself. We don't have our landscape architect here, and we don't have our civil engineer to answer your question about the fill. Just, let me just jump back to that question first. Um, even though I'm not a civil engineer, I know that um, there, there was a tremendous amount of um, uh, scrutiny in terms of storm water and all the various conditions required by water, you know, for water quality and so forth and retention and, and biofiltration. And so, you know, they work towards balancing the site. They have to import. But um, I, I do know that this came up quite a bit in the meetings. We weren't trying to get it up to the level of Civic Center Drive, um, but we were, we were trying to lessen the slope and really work with um, just the overall grading for, for water quality and, ret and retention and so okay. forth. And then uh, I'm trying to, I was going back to the landscape architect's plan to see if there was a fence along the parking there. I thought that, was, that would be your question, but um, the units are entered off the, off the corridors, and then there's a community entrance off of the community room with, um, you know, patio doors that go out into that, um, you know, the gathering area with okay. bocce ball and tables and so, so forth. So that, that's how you're planning that for That would be the main to entrance to the okay. common area, yes. All right. Okay. And then um, uh, on the second and third floors, you've got uh, trash collection areas. Yes, those are those are trash chutes, uh, the, and they'll go down to the yes. first floor. Okay, yes. all right, mm -hmm. all right. Thank you. That was that covers my questions. Commissioner, I think we've, you've got more. Yeah. Commissioner Looney, please. Um, Rick, on the grading, on the southwest corner of the property, there's on the sheet. It's the lower left corner. They've got a five foot high retaining wall. And so what they've done is they built that retaining wall up so they can get that site relatively level. Okay. And that's where that 5,000, it's just under 5,000 yards that they're bringing in. They're using, they're cutting about 300 yards. Right. But they're bringing that soil in to level that back portion of the property to, well, to where it works well with the finished grades and the drainage for the entire property. Also along that uh, west and the south edge, They've got a, um, the permeable surface of the driveway, so all the runoff, not all of it, but a majority of the runoff on that southern half of the property goes to the wards that lower left corner of the property, 
and that's where that water is put back into the soil. So that's where that 5,000 yard fill comes in at. I appreciate those comments, very insightful. And additionally, we had to work with getting um, an accessible path from Civic Center Drive down to the community lobby to the front entrance. So there was a balance between um, you know, diminishing the import required, but meeting all the perimeter conditions and so forth, while trying to minimize retaining walls. Thank you. Commissioner Gerritsen? Yes, uh, a question. Uh, this goes up almost 45 feet. And with the additional fill, will the single family homes to the north, will they be looking up at this property? The, the roof line will be higher than that level, correct? It, it will be higher. It depends on, on the property. We had an exhibit that we presented to you in December 2015. I don't think it's in this package. Let me just check. That showed the relationship. It's not in this package, but... Um, Generally, the cul-de-sac to the north is above the property. That doesn't mean they will see, you know, part of the roof. They won't see on top of the roof, but they'll be, they'll be looking into the... So the building itself will be taller than the, the ground level or the yard of the single-family homes. Yes. So they'll be, in effect, looking up at it. So they're not going to be looking down at mechanical space on the roof and that sort of thing. Don't so there's really so. nobody that's going to be looking down on it. They're all going to be looking up. Uh, I believe so. And, and, and all of our mechanical equipment is screened on the roof in any case. All right. Well, that, that's the way I read it. I just wanted to confirm it. Thank you. Okay. We have no other questions from here. Um, Susan McAllister, please come forward. State your name. Give your address. And... I'm Susan McAllister, and I live at 690 Ocean View Drive here in Vista. Um, and my biggest concern is what's going to happen with the congestion, traffic, trying to, I assume, the driveway, if I'm understanding right, is going out onto Civic Center. And if so, I, I can't imagine how that's all going to work with the traffic that's already there. And I think I heard something about there was going to be another lane or something. If that's the case, I guess that would help. But how soon is that actually going to happen? I'm, I'm really concerned about how this is all going to work. So Thank that's you. my thought. Thank you so much. Carrie Michael, followed by Anna Strawn. Hello, I'm Carrie Michael. I live at 903 Crescent Drive in Vista, and I've lived there since 77. Um, I have a concern with the traffic as well. This traffic going down the street now, people are going 40, 50 miles an hour up and down Civic Center, and it's, I'm surprised there aren't more accidents. Luckily, they put the light in at Crescent Drive, but still, people are still running the lights. Um, I can't imagine having that many more people, especially seniors driving down the street, with people driving 40 and 50 miles an hour. Um, it just seemed awfully dense. I thought we were gonna be more residential rather than apartments when I moved here. And now, I, mean, I moved from LA, so I like Vista the way it is, where it's a little bit more small town. Um, it seems like there's a lot more crime. I hear sirens all the time now, uh, especially since they put 7-Eleven on the corner of Civic Center and South Santa Fe. Um, and these little apartments, 500 square feet, do they have a blow up of the, um, like a floor plan? Because it seems awfully small for a se even a senior to live in. It's like a, it's like a closet. So, um, and are there elevators for these people? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, I'm concerned about the traffic and uh, I just think it's too dense an area. Thank you. Thank you. Anna Strong, please. Hi, I'm 
Aniston. I live at 1016 Orleavo. I have several concerns, and my first is concessions. It seems to be the mantra of VISTA. We are going to concede and give you more units other than what should be planned here, which is 60. But we're going to give you 81, and next door we're going to give you 10 more. It seems during good economic times we shouldn't have to give as many concessions as we have in the past. I was here three years ago when we gave a concession to 7-Eleven to have alcohol, even though we have the amount of alcohol that should have been allowed in that quadrant, we gave them a concession. When will the concession stop? There's good economic times. We don't have to buckle under a developer that wants to develop a dense area of small, very small apartments. My other concern is also the traffic and people per square foot. Some cities have a guideline. If you have 400 square feet, you are allowed one. If you have 500, you're allowed two. And what is the guideline for the square footage here and the number of people that can be in these apartments? My concern is also street parking. Where are they going to park? And we also have four corners that have extremely high crime. And that was proven when I was here three years ago asking about the alcohol that wanted that 7-Eleven wanted to sell. This is a high crime area. I'd like to see the number of hands of people that actually live in one or two miles of this development. Okay? Well, we're gonna be the ones suffering. And if you look at the developments on North Santa Fe, they are not attractive. And we okayed that during bad economic times. Do we really have to continue that? Another one of my concerns is that the project seems to be sketchy, okay? The Wakeland developer came up here and said, well, you know, we have these guidelines. No, we don't let kids stay there. And well, if the spouse, it's too sketchy. Where are the specifics? We need specifics on the entire project. And finally, um, I think that uh, VISTA needs to reevaluate. My brother-in-law came down from SLO the other day. He first came here 43 years ago. And he said, what is wrong with VISTA? Look at this development. Of course, SLO doesn't even allow drive throughs You can't have a McDonald's with a drive through because they care about their community. They care about development. They care how they look. We're the backside of Carlsbad. Carlsbad doesn't have the kind of development we are having. They're not having all that affordable housing. Okay, so we have to have a standard somewhere in this town. It has to stop. Thank you. Lori Fro Froelich, please. Hello, my name is Lori Froelich, and I live at 1026 Orleavo Drive. Um, I'm here also to uh, oppose this development um, for many of the same reasons that my neighbors have mentioned. Um, I really feel that the word density comes into play a lot here. I mean, the development that happened on Santa Fe, I don't know how many units that was, but this one being 80 units at 500 square feet per unit and fitting all of this on two acres of land, just that is just ludicrous in my head. I can't even hardly wrap my mind around it. So the density thing, I think, is really an important thing to consider. And what is that going to mean with traffic? What is it going to mean with just safety? What is it going to mean with security? Um, you have all these people that are in a small space and we all know that a lot of times when you have just too many people in a small space, it just causes a problem in itself. So that's one thing. Um, also, we have a lot of underdeveloped areas in Vista where I really feel it would be more appropriate to do a project like this instead of coming right into the middle of downtown and throwing it into an area that's already overdeveloped. We could put in something a lot more single level, you know, less obtrusive make it more old Vista feeling instead of some new kind of uh, downtown like Los Angeles or San Francisco. We're not trying to build skyscrapers here. We're trying to keep it ranch style. And I think a lot of people are here for that reason. They like that feeling. 
um, I really feel that crime might be affected. Um, you know, seniors are at risk of being taken advantage of, and this being a senior development, you know, you might have more people coming in that take advantage of the seniors. Um, what kind of security is going to be part of this? Or do they have 24-hour security? Um, and uh, the parking situation around the perimeter, um, again, that's a very dense looking, as well as just all those cars being at the way on Civic Center Drive. I mean, 150, 115, I think they said, parking spaces is a lot of spaces. And there, are they going to be guarded? You know, these seniors, again, there's going to be the seniors' cars out there. So that's a, something to consider. Um, I also feel like the setbacks are pretty shallow. And that cars could just drive right up. You know, we have so many accidents as it is on Civic Center Drive with the shallow setbacks. So that could be a risk in itself with uh, accidents happening, cars going up the sidewalks and into the walls or whatever might happen there. So... Um, just wanted to go on the record for saying that I do oppose this. Uh, and one other thing that I'm thinking about is the, um, they talked about the EIR report and the exemptions on the, on the environmental impact. Why would this project be exempt? Only because it's for low income? I don't really understand that. And that's about it for me. Thank you. Uh, David Pallinger. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. I um, am David Pallinger. I live at 29251 Vista Valley Drive in Vista. I have worked with uh, Wakeland for a number of years on different projects, and I can assure you and uh, my fellow citizens that they go above and beyond to deliver a superior product and to manage a project in a superior way. Um, I have not seen any issues with any of their projects over the years. Um, I think this project brings an economic uh, value to our community. I think the current uh, property there is an eyesore in our community, and this will not only bring up property values in that area, but bring up all of Vista with it. It's a, it'll be an economic benefit to the community. I think it brings a social benefit to our community. I think it's going to bring a higher caliber of resident to that area than we have now at the current uh, motel situation. Um, and I think seniors are a good value to the community, and I think it adds a value to our community to have seniors have affordable housing. And finally, aesthetically, this will be far superior than what we have there currently. And I think the developer has gone uh, above and beyond again to address the aesthetic com considerations, traffic, drainage, and all those associated issues, and I think this will really be a benefit to our community. Uh, Mr. Pallinger, before you leave, yes, you, um, you had you said you had a relationship with Wakeland in the past. Yes. Uh, in what capacity? I've worked on a couple of projects helping manage their construction process. Okay. And one of them was a senior veterans facility that they did an amazing job. This is up in Riverside County um, to really provide a superior product for our veterans and seniors in that particular project. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jack Gallagher, you don't want to come up again, or? Oh, okay. Thank you. I just want to um, take the opportunity uh, to try to answer some of the concerns that were brought forward. The traffic um, was mentioned as one concern, and the city um, did an environmental review, or hired a consultant doing an, an environmental review, and the traffic engineer indicated, uh, and it's in the staff report, that um, you know the overall traffic increase would um, would fall below what would be considered a significant impact. Um, that's one thing. The unit size it comes up. These unit sizes um, meet the tax credit minimum, or they're above the tax credit minimum sizes. We've done them all over California. 
it's interesting. We will have criticisms about affordable housing that say the units are too big and the primary purpose is to help the community solve this regional housing crisis. And so, there, you know, on, on the one hand, we're dealing with, with, you know, those that think that the, you know, affordable housing units sh should be smaller, and so we're, we're trying to bring them down smaller to a reasonable level, and these units have been constructed and built, and I can say that the sizes that we have in here work um, without any problem. And we do have, in this submittal, the full submittal, we do have full-blown um, unit plans that are furnished. Um, the density bonus keeps coming up. That's a state law. The, um, and I won't go into the detail of that, but it's the, the, the developer by right is allowed three concessions. So as, as you know, um, tricky as that word may seem, concession, it's, it's, uh, it's a state law, uh, as is the density bonus if you're providing affordable housing to certain levels. Um, uh, and then um, the parking is all on the site. It's not on the street. Someone mentioned uh, parking on the street. It's all off-site parking. Um, and there's a 81 spaces, not 115. And um, the setbacks are very much in keeping with an urban location, in my opinion. We've done plenty of projects that are in an urban location like this, and they have a very nice street presence with you know patios and so forth. So I personally don't see that as an issue. And then finally, we reached out to the community and notified all of the community within 500 feet. We had a community meeting for the very purpose of bringing together all these different opinions and, to, and take them to heart. Only two residents showed up, and they spoke. Their comments were favorable. They live just to the north, very close to the project. And um, those are the only residents that showed up to, to speak with us. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher, for... for answering those questions. I have one for you uh, that came up um, about a management plan. I think that's a great idea. Is that something that Wakeland puts into place or uh, whoever's going to manage the project? Yes. So there will be a management plan? That there, there's, a, there's an entire um, fully scoped out development agreement with the city for the affordable housing. Um, very precise, uh, dealing with management, the 50 or 55 year limit, um, all of the income thresholds, the screening process, and so forth. Perfect. Yeah. Um, security cameras on site? Do you typically have? Yeah, you, usually we get together with asset management, the management company, and the architect, and we lines of site, and we do do security cameras where they're necessary. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Rossler? I know it's it's difficult at this point, but could you give us ballpark um, about where you think your rents are going to be for the affordable units? Maybe a bit more precise than ballpark. <clears throat> We're looking at median area income. It's all mathematically from 30% to 60%. So rents can go from, say, 400 to right around $1,000 for 60%. So for the, for the one-bedroom units, the rent would be $400 a month for a senior? Yeah, it depends on what income level they're at. Yes. Uh, up to a thousand dollars. That would be the two bedroom and okay. sixty percent. Okay, but certainly that in in the city right now, affordable housing or the the rents that are market rate rents are are pretty significant right now, and so uh, this would be a a way to solve that. So thank, thank you very you. much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Robert Bro Brower has gone on um, to say he does not wish to speak, but he is in favor of the project. So thank you very much. 
Next, uh, Jack Ferris. I'm in favor of. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Uh, Evelyn Canales. I'm Evelyn Canales. I live at 715 Ocean View Terrace, and I believe that's within 500 feet of the property. And I was floored when I got this notice. So I would have been there at that meeting. As crazy as my schedule is, and I know that everybody else has pretty sc crazy schedules, um, <laughs> both me and my husband would have been there. So I don't know what happened, but I did not get that notice. Um, I agree with, I mean, I want to reiterate everything that these women said because I'm right on there and I had those words to speak myself. So they were very well spoken. Um, the on-site parking, usually it's visitors and whatnot that, that that parking won't be enough for. So I don't know how many visitors or people that are allowed, are allowed to be on that site. Um, so that's going to be a problem. The other thing is traffic, again, it's not significant. I, I just don't believe that because right now the traffic is way beyond controllable. It's, you know, I'm in and out all the time during rush hour at other times and it's very difficult coming out. So I have relatives that will not come out when they come to visit me, will not come out to Civic Center Drive because it is that dangerous, um, especially if they're going to turn left. So it's, it's, a, it's a game, you've got to play. Okay, is this okay? I know it's, you know, okay, go, but I'm, I still might get hit. Um, it doesn't matter if it's widening, that this is the main route to the freeway. So there's always gonna be a collective, huge amount of cars coming through. Of course, there's gonna be lag times, but you know, I have, I have little ones, I have kids. I sometimes allow my daughter to walk home on occasion, and now I feel like I can't because, or won't, will not allow her to, because the traffic will be that much worse. And occasionally, her and my husband will go and take walks and, or do a run. It's getting less and less safe. And, when I, and I've been here in Vista for 15 years. So my children have grown up here. This is all they know. They love Vista. My daughter does not want us to move. You know, she's, she's in middle school. And it's, it's just not getting safe. So our area is very much... Um, Family oriented. I, I don't mind. I don't. I'm not opposed to affordable living spaces. I'm not. I'm definitely not opposed to senior spaces. But that amount, especially in this condensed area, is just way too much. And it's 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 not a place where I want to continue to raise my family. Thank you, <laughs> Cliff Kaiser, please. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, Cliff Kaiser, 1620 Calle Dulce here in Vista. Um, a couple of comments. Uh, I'm opposed to this uh, development for several reasons. One is we are talking about the gateway or one of the gateways into Vista. And this one is particularly noteworthy because we're coming, it's a gateway into downtown Vista, which is already growing and becoming a very vibrant place uh, compared to years past. It's a gateway because of this place right here in the Civic Center, and it's also a gateway that brings more people from out of Vista because of the Moonlight Amphitheater. So whatever gets developed here and whatever it looks like, it can't be conceded to this and conceded to that and over dense here and too little parking there. It has to be a home run. It has to be something that improves the image of Vista, not just gets by. Now, as a side note, although that motel that's there now might need a little bit of a facelift, it is a cute little place down in the, in the uh, cul-de-sac there. Um, now, we need, a, we need a affordable housing. We're mandated to, for that. I, I, I acknowledge that. And senior housing is something that's been talked about that we need here in Vista for a long time, too. So I'm not saying that we, we don't want to move in this direction. But because of the concessions, Look at uh, Sky Apartments, brand new, beautiful place, nice amenities right there, South Melrose on Bobier. Every day you go there, they're parking on the streets because of the concessions or whatever reason, they didn't put enough parking in their apartments. We're gonna do the same thing again and again. Don't give any concessions to parking. Uh, setback concession, why? Why not make this a beautiful place to drive by? 
and why so small? Why do we have to concede on this? Why not just follow the guidelines that are already in place to make this a beautiful place? Um, too dense, that's already been talked about a, a bunch of times. And there was a comment earlier about the, the notice going out within 500 feet of the, of the community, and I think that was a goodwill gesture, if I'm not mistaken, by the developer to do that, but 500 feet is really a, is a non-starter. That doesn't get out to anybody that's really concerned about uh, a development. I've argued that before, probably you guys in the council before, that it, we really need to, to notice a, a much larger portion of the community and reach out in different ways, social media, whatever, so that people know what's going on in their town and they have uh, the opportunity uh, to comment. And my last comment is, um, uh, there was comments about the 62-year-old requirement being in there. I'm wondering how that's enforced. If that's just a management issue locally, maybe that's the only thing we can do. But uh, what's to prevent two years from now when management changes and stuff like that, and now we've got a bunch of teenagers and whatever else going in there? It's not mandated by law, I think. Uh, or if you could clarify that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. That's all the speaker slips I have for this evening. Uh, Commissioner Bell. Thank you. Let's ask some legal questions. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Chow or Mr. Stone, can we talk about the term concessions as it's being used in this situation? Because I think we hear the term concession and we think we're rolling over or giving something up or just giving in because there's more money to be had. But maybe one of you could address what the legal requirement is for the city to comply with California law here. And I'm, I'm doing this just so the people who have spoken know that there's a reason for this and it's not a choice that we're making, yes or no, black or white, but there are methods and practices that we have to go through as a city um, and as a community to live in this state. So if you guys could address that, I'd appreciate it even briefly. Uh, certainly. The, the state has identified uh, affordable housing and increasing housing as a, a, a goal. And as a result, uh, there are uh, state laws that try to create a balance between um, creating an environment that will allow for uh, affordable housing and uh, within some parameters based upon uh, local ordinances. So the density bonus is such a law and when a certain level of affordable housing is provided, um, then there's an allowance for an increase in density. Uh, in this instance, the developer more than exceeds um, the uh, requirement for affordable housing, uh, much more than the minimum required to achieve the 35 density, percent density bonus. So that is, then becomes a state mandate uh, that the uh, city um, must accommodate. Uh, as for the concessions, um, uh, that's a term of art that's actually used in the statute itself. It just means um, a form of relaxation of um, the city's uh, requirements. Uh, the uh, parking uh, is actually a mandated uh, standard, uh, so there is not discretion with respect to the parking that's available to uh, the city under the law. The other two um, adjustments are uh, based upon requests of the developer in the event that they are truly unnecessary to render the project affordable, uh, there may be a basis on which to uh, not grant the concession or the relaxation. But um, if they are necessary for the project to be economically viable, uh, then the concession would be um, mandated. Um, so it sounds like the parking itself is one issue because there's a specific state statute or law that says if it's affordable or if it's senior, specifically senior, then it's one half parking space per unit, correct? And, and I, assume, I assume completely, I don't know this, but I assume the policy is that people of a certain age are less likely to drive cars or have cars or they are likely to use public transport or is it low income? I, I, I don't know the policy, but I'm guessing that's why instead of normal apartments, we're looking at two or three spaces per unit, we're looking at less. So parking, we're, we're stuck with. The other two, we're looking at the setback and what was the other concession? The unit sizes. The unit sizes. Um, I'm probably the one up here that most recently lived in sizes of units that were similar to those. Um, so I, it, it is out there. I don't, I don't love it. I don't think anybody loves it. But the question I will have for the developer in a second is if you could address 
the necessity of the number of units and the sizes of the size of the units versus your ability to actually provide affordable housing. Because again, you're a nonprofit, so your goal here is to actually provide the housing, not just to build something, turn a profit, sell it, and move on. And so maybe you could clarify that um, for us. That would be helpful. And in the same breath, talk about the leasing process because I think that there's some confusion as to what you or what the management company is required to do and to force people to comply with and what you do legally as far as contracts and if someone were to violate that lease or break that lease, what your policy or what your management company's policy would be to help protect that, that community and make sure it stays at a certain feel of a senior living community at 62 or above. Thanks. Certainly. Thank you. I'll do that one first and I'll go backwards. Sure. The 62 year old, that, that's actually in our regulatory agreement, it'll be through our tax credits, which is a, will be a federal financing, limited partners involved. Believe me, if we go out of that limit, the limited partner steps in. Limited partner steps in and it's not a good scene. We own forever apartments. We have a 70 year lease, it'll go on if we're good people, we'll do another 20 years, it will always be affordable. It will be reversionary back to the city, so it'll all be on public lands. Um, so that's it, we do not turn, we get a little developer fee in front and that's it, we have to go and do more development. We are for the provision of affordable housing. We're a long-term owner. And, and with that, can you just address the, the number of units and the size of the units relative to your ability to make it affordable? Mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming this is necessary. I'm assuming if you could build larger units and make them affordable, everyone would love to see seniors have cheap housing that is broader and bigger and we'd all want that. But um, there's, there's trade-offs here. That's a good, good question, thank you. you. You finance these through equity, through tax credits, and through debt. Well, affordable means that the rents are fairly low. You can only carry so much debt. If your debt is this much, you can only build so the cost per unit, it's, it's limited. If I was a for-profit, I could make a very large unit, I could sell it, and you can see what the prices are for rentals now and for for sale. It, the economics are such that we're really into the sweet spot. We've done thousands of units, these unit sizes. Uh, we have great ar architects and I think it works. And then on top of that, we talked about leasing. So in your experience with the Oceanside project or I think you, your colleague had mentioned the veterans project did up in Riverside. And I assume you're developing, so at some point you pass this on to management. But what's your knowledge of the, the patterns and practices of the enforcement of the senior living facilities? We hire, there's probably two go-to management companies and they're very experienced in tax credit realm, which every year they're audited. They have to make sure that everybody who's on the lease is living there, if they're, and we do, if someone is being a bad tenant, it doesn't mean they're there for life. We're gonna remove them. So we also know where the front end of affordable housing has got to look good. It's got to be run good. Every time we bring somebody to our, uh, tour our apartments, because we'll probably be going to their community, they're so happy. You can hear D David saying that he's been to some. We know that we're under the microscope. Okay. And I bring that up for the people who spoke about it because you have real concerns. These are not, I mean, you're not making this up. I completely understand this is there, but we're not the first community to deal with this and we're not the first people to raise these concerns. And so there are systems in place, especially with affordable housing where it's directly tied to tax credits and other government programs where in, in a perfect world, everything works smooth and goes forward. And so the city and the companies do their best to hold on to that. And if they don't, there's consequences as far as being able to continue to operate it and function. So um, let's see, what was the other question uh, for the city? The, the EIR, um, that's a full environmental impact review. Can you explain briefly, well, maybe I should clarify, there was a question about significant traffic changes and the word significant came up. And I think similar to concession, that's a term of art that's actually used in government reports to define whether it's increasing past a certain amount or not past a certain amount. And so obviously if there's 80 units built here, there is going to be more traffic. No one is denying that. You're absolutely correct. But 
in order to judge whether that traffic is going to be legally significant or significant in a report, we have to look at some standards. We can't just go with our gut feeling. And so I, the city has done and gone and looked at this potential project and said that based on the data we have, it's not significant legally or as defined in the report. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And it basically, would you like me to expand on it? Please, that'd as be great. As far as the... Uh, as far as the trips that are generated out of the project, we look at SANDAG, they have a trip generation table for different kinds of projects. And in this case, um, we're looking at a ratio for a retirement community, for a senior community. So basically they identify in those trip generation tables that you would be in this particular project generating about four average daily trips uh, per unit, per weekday. And so we run that number based on the total of 81 units, and we then do the math and say, okay, there'll be approximately uh, 324 trips generated out of this project. There's also a breakdown in terms of the peak hour trips during the morning, during the afternoon, uh, morning being 6 to 9.30, afternoon uh, between 3 and 6.30, and how many trips are generated within those time frames based on a percentage calculation that SANDAG provides um, to the jurisdictions. And out of that calculation, um, being the fact that there are 16 trips in the peak hour in the morning and then 23 in the afternoon, you add those up and you're basically not exceeding what would normally be a concern, which would be 50. So being 50 the threshold, that's when we have a concern at that point and a traffic impact study would be required. Uh, that's when significant impacts we would have to look at yes or no and how do we lessen those. But in this case, um, that's where the concern is not there. And also because there was an EIR prepared for downtown specific plan that covers the site. So. so that earlier EIR actually covers the entire area, including this development, even though it existed as a motel or does exist right now? Correct. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's all I have right now. Uh, Commissioner Gerritsen, please. Uh, pa Patsy, I have a question about the entrance and exit specifically the southernmost exit. Will people be able to go out of that, turn right on Civic Center, and then get in that far left lane in order to make a U-turn on Civic Center Drive? In other words, how much, how much space are they going to have from turning right out of that southernmost exit before you get to Santa Fe? And is this going to be right turn only, you can only go south on, on uh, Civic Center or you have to turn west on uh, Santa Fe. If somebody's coming out of that southernmost driveway and they're trying to get on the left turn going on to Santa Fe, um, as far as that concern, um, we're, our traffic engineer um, obviously looked at this project um, I'm not aware of a concern being brought up during review uh, for this particular project because if there were, obviously, we would not have agreed to that driveway location uh, where it is being proposed. Um, so I have to believe from a staff's perspective, um, not having heard about that concern, that um, it was not raised as being a, a potential issue or concern with the project design. I would think with more cars coming out of there, that there's going to be some that want to turn right out of there and immediately get in that left lane in order to go north on Santa Fe or north on Civic Center Drive. So I, I just can't imagine that not being a problem. It just, it, it's one of those things that, we, I mean, at this point is um, we're looking at a project design and, and thinking into the future is where traffic would go and again, from a staff's reviewing perspective and knowing how circulation takes place on Civic Center in Santa Fe. Um, again, I did not hear or neither hear or nor re, um, heard the concern during review cycle, so. Thank you. Commissioner Rossler, please. Uh, Patsy, uh, from what I am, what we've been presented with uh, here tonight, um, this project's not only going to enter into a, an agreement with the city, but with the state on how many units uh, are going to be here. 
they're going to be age restricted to 62. Somebody uh, living in that unit's got to be 62 years uh, or older, uh, and that's it's going to be that way for the next 55 years, based on the current. Uh, median income in the city, the rents are going to be somewhere between 400 to 1,000 units. That'll go up as the median income in the city go, goes up, but uh, that makes, and, and that, uh, that rate is, uh, is in the agreement and, and, and somewhat set in stone, uh, can only be adjusted if the median income in the city goes up. So these are going to be affordable units for seniors, period. That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Looney. Patsy, when we did the um, early design review, I remember there was an issue about a center median in the street. Um, was that, is that still a part of the master plan that has been developed by engineering? Or is that something that has been done away with? because it begins to address your question, Gary. Let me pull up the, uh, the aerial photo here. So you're speaking of a center medium actually prolonging all the way to the intersection, or I'm not sure I understand your question. If we look at the, the center of the site, mm -hmm. um, I believe on the early design review, there was a left-hand turn lane as if we were, when we were traveling north, that, were, that would allow people to go into that development. I see, so if you're traveling north on Civic Center Drive, would allow, there will be an opening in that median to allow somebody to drive into the project site? Correct. Is that what but you're I, referring to? Yes, and I didn't know if that was what was on the um, site plan when we did the pre-design review back in the end of 15. I, I do not recall that being the case. Um, I, I don't believe, I'm not sure if Mr. Colling recalls that or not during the early design. I don't think it was. It's he shaking no. There was no turn lane into the site from northbound Civic Center in the pre-application or the early design. It was shown with the raised median that's there today, so it would be right in, right out, and that's the way it was proposed in the okay. first meeting. Okay, good. Thank you. I have a comment and then ultimately a question, and I'm not sure if the question should be for staff or for Mr. Ferris, so I'll just start and throw it out there. Um, <clears throat> as far as the concessions for the size, I think it's fine. I have a 87-year-old mother who lives in a 1,200-square-foot house who uses probably around 500 square feet. It's the den, the bathroom, the kitchen. That's about it. The rest of the house she closes off. So I understand that. Uh, the setbacks, um, I understand that. And I, I personally do see a need for senior affordable living because the seniors that are baby boomers that are approaching seniors, eh, many of them didn't plan well for retirement and Social Security just isn't gonna cut it. So I get it. Um, I also understand, appreciate that um, a senior couple, highly unlikely that they're gonna have two cars. They'll have one because they go places together. Uh, the traffic, Mm, my mom doesn't leave the house until after the traffic stops. So she hits the streets about 9.30 and then, you know, she does her thing and she's back home by about 2. So I, I don't, there'll be extra traffic, in my opinion, during those times, but not necessarily in the times of um, peak traffic, you know, 7.30 in the morning with people going to work. But where my concern really lies is, I got my mother in one of those apartments, and she's got her little car. Well, I come over to visit. Where do I park? So I see that, if, in my opinion, that what's 
lacking in the parking arena is for the visitors, visitors that come in. I, I don't see that there's any parking for them. And boy, I'd hate to park in bonds across the street and, you know, schlep across the street. I don't think that's what the, the answer is either. So uh, Patsy, Mr. Ferris, anybody have So when, when we looked at parking, we looked at the state mandate, but we also looked at it, at our, in, in the, and that was the legal perspective, which again was 41 spaces, but we also looked at it in what I call the practical perspective because we feel like we're partners with the city on this. So um, we looked at the city of San Diego's parking study, which has been used all over California. It was very comprehensive where they studied um, affordable parking and you know, one, of, one of the comments in their study, landmark studies, says parking demand for affordable projects is about one half of typical rental units in San Diego. Almost half the units surveyed had no vehicle. And that was for, non, that was for all projects. And for seniors, it's, it's even less. So what we did was we, we used the city of San Diego. Again, many cities are looking to it. We used their, um, their worst case. Um, calculation because they have high demand, medium, and low. And we're within a half a mile of the Sprinter station. Mm -hmm. But in order to get to the medium and lower columns, we'd have to do some mental gymnastics with GIS um, software and so forth which, which we, we, that we don't have. So we just went to the high demand, the worst case, and we, we came up with 49 and a half spaces for the one bedrooms, 15 for the twos, 12 guest parking spaces and four for staff. And we came up with, quite coincidentally, 81 spaces. That's not, well, I, only, I only did this in preparation for this um, hearing, but we had simply done one space per unit knowing that we were far exceeding the state mandate, but it's interesting that we came out to that exact number yeah, for maybe. the worst case. Uh, one more. Will the um, residents who have, who do not have a vehicle, will they be provided bus passes, uh, sprinter passes, any kind of a concession to um, help, encourage? Actually, we haven't envisioned that. It's not in the pro forma, I'll tell you right now. But we'll, what we do do is resident services, they always take a look and see what's necessary. That's why we're not, they, they have community meetings, they see what's, what they want, what they need, what kind of programs. And if we can afford it, if that's really what the tenancy wants and that's what they need, we'll do it. Okay. If we can afford it. Save a unit for my mother. Okay. <laughs> Um, Commissioner Gerritsen, please. I have a question. If I'm uh, going north on Civic Center Drive and I wish to go into this complex, where do I turn? I go across Santa Fe and I have to go to what street before I can make a U-turn and come back in, in order to make a right into this? Is it Ocean View? It's Crescent, isn't it, where the light is? What is that first I, opportunity yeah. for somebody going north mm -hmm. that can make a U-turn in order to get into this uh, property? I believe it would be Ocean View Drive. Um, I just don't have the, unfortunately the aerial doesn't go as far up, but I believe that that would be the first one where they would be able to make a U, U, or a U turn. And that's a left turn lane mm -hmm. only? Correct. Okay. There is a dedicated left turn on there. Okay, thank you. Anybody else, commissioners? Close the public hearing, begin our discussion, render a decision. Okay, I jump in. Um, I agree with um, Mr. Kaiser that 
back when I first moved to Vista in 1977-78, I thought that was the cutest little piece of property and the way they had designed that as a motel. Um, I'm glad that recently that somebody um, kicked it up a notch because it was looking pretty bad. I, th I like the site. I like the, um, the use for affordable seniors. I'm for that. I also agree with Mr. Kaiser that this is a, a gateway into the city. So if, um, Wakeland, if you can do anything to make it, it, it's pretty, it's very pretty, but you know, kick it up just a little bit more on, on along Civic Center Drive, maybe a little bit more landscaping along Civic Center Drive so that it really, you drive by and you, you have the wow appeal as you're moving to downtown. Um, I think for all of these reasons and the need for senior housing, um, I think it's appropriate for the space. So I will be um, casting my vote in favor of this project. Commissioner Rossler. I, I, tend to, I tend to agree. Um, the, the, we've all read about uh, market rate housing and, and the need for affordable housing within uh, not only the city but the region. Um, I've had uh, family, re I have relatives who uh, have lived in uh, similar facilities. I don't have a problem with the bedroom size. Uh, the age restriction uh, is at 62, I think, is, is somewhat unique, uh, and that'll last for 55 years. So I, I think this is a project that the city needs. Uh, I think there are a ton of assurances that it will uh, be maintained uh, and that there'll be annual audits to make sure that there were, the, the units are being uh, rented as they, they should be. Uh, so I think there are assurances there. Um, so with that said, I'm going to move that we adopt the resolution approving the site development plan for the 80 affordable apartment units for seniors and one management unit um, with the revised conditions uh, 60 or 34 through uh, 36, I believe. Uh, that further restrict the, or give definition to um, the affordable, uh, the affordability of the units. So. Added landscaping. Um, added landscaping uh, uh, across the front of the project. Um, can we define that a little bit more? Uh, additional trees, uh, uh, shrubs. Both. Okay. Yeah. Trees and shrubs, so we Trees. get some height and some color. Okay, uh, with additional landscaping uh, across the uh, the front to include uh, uh, additional trees and shrubs uh, to uh, enhance the uh, uh, the view of the front. Commissioner Jackal, I was starting out to second your motion on the additional landscaping, but now I will second the motion overall. Thank you. Any comments from commissioners prior to a vote? Seeing none, please vote. Please note the project passes um, by all commissioners with Commissioner Carroll being absent. Are there any students here tonight? We can sign your paperwork. And we'll take a five minute break, please.
Okay, welcome back. Our ne next project before us is an early design review, P17-0120 Civic Center Villas, ABS Holdings Limited. Mr. Ressler, will you lead us through? Thank you, Chairman Kramer, members of the Planning Commission. Um, the item before you tonight uh, is an early design review uh, for the Civic Center Villas project. The uh, application number is P17-0120. Sorry about that. Um, to give you a, a brief overview of the, the EDR process, uh, um, the early design review process is an opportunity for the Planning Commission to uh, review initial proposals and provide uh, preliminary comments to the applicant directly. Um, keep in mind that the proposals have not been routed to uh, all departments and the city has not done a thorough evaluation of the project. Um, the applicant uh, will be here to provide you a formal presentation. At the conclusion of that presentation, they'll be here to answer any questions in regards to the design and the thought process behind the proposal. Um, in, in regards to a vote, uh, the uh, early design review process doesn't require a vote or an action from the Planning Commission. It's more providing direction to the, uh, to the applicant. Uh, staff has received a preliminary proposal to develop 10 uh, unit apartment complex on a 0.4 acre uh, site. The site is located on the west side of Civic Center Drive, north, north of Ocean View Drive. The subject site is currently developed with a music school. Again, the project area uh, is 0.48 acres. It's one legal lot. Uh, it's currently developed with the Music Experience Learning Center. Uh, the properties to the north and to the south of the subject site are developed with single-family homes. Project, uh, property to the west is developed with a single-family home. Properties to the east across uh, uh, Civic Center Drive are developed with professional office buildings. Uh, the subject site uh, maintains a general plan land use designation of mixed use, which allows for up to 40 dwelling units per acre. In terms of zoning, the subject site maintains a uh, zoning designation of mixed use 30, which allows for up to three stories and a maximum density of 30 dwelling units per acre. The proposed project would require a site development plan, CEQA review, as well as a landscape review. Uh, staff does note that based on the size of the project, uh, the entitlement of this project would go before the zoning administrator. However, the decision of the zoning administrator can be appealed up to the Planning Commission. The project itself is 10 apartments uh, within two separate buildings. Uh, the site will maintain one two-story building and one three-story building. Uh, the three-story building is actually two stories above surface parking, so in terms of massing, it would represent as a three-story uh, building. Each apartment would maintain two bedrooms, the density of the project would be 20.8 uh, dwelling units per acre. Maximum height of the project would be 34 foot one inch. Uh, again, the 0.48 acre site uh, would uh, be developed with a one two-story building located towards the front of the project uh, with the uh, three-story building located towards the rear of the site. In terms of parking, the site would maintain a total of 25 parking spaces, which is consistent with the new mixed-use parking standards, which requires a uh, parking calculation of 2.5 spaces per two-bedroom unit. In terms of site amenities, the uh, project has been designed to maintain a common area deck with a barbecue facility towards the front of the site, as well as individual private patios for each individual unit. Architecturally, the project has been designed around a California Spanish architectural style. Uh, the buildings, again, would be two and three stories with gable-style roofs. The stucco exteriors uh, have been designed and enhanced with uh, arch windows, uh, accent corbels, uh, stone uh, wainscot treatment, as well as decorative railings. This is a perspective of the project looking southwest from Civic Center into the site itself. 
the units themselves would be 894 square feet. Uh, it would provide for living space on the first floor with bedroom facilities on the second floor. With that, staff is requesting the Planning Commission provide uh, a direction to the applicant in terms of design of the project. The applicant is here, the owner as well as the architect, to provide the Planning Commission with the presentation. And at the conclusion of that presentation, staff as well as the uh, uh, design team are here to answer any questions you might have tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, commissioners, if you remember, since we haven't done a, um, um, a review in quite a while, that we let staff make their report, then the applicant makes the report, then we categorize our questions by site design and grading is one, architecture, the second one, parking and traffic, the third, landscape and amenities, and then any other comments. So that'll be the format that we use for this evening. Uh, Mr. Sima? I'm representing ABSM Holdings, and today here I have John Maple. He's from the architect team here. So, yeah, we've been working on the project for quite some time. We have had a lot of uh, meetings with the staff over the last year, and uh, fortunately got caught into the new regulations on the extended parking, so we were able to go back and uh, comply with the new requirements. So, so. With that, I will <clears throat> present to you uh, uh, John Maple. He's with the architect team. So, I'm John Maple, um, architect representing Helms and Malsini, who couldn't be here this evening. I'm at 25128th Street in the city of Del Mar. Um, after, I, I know our Wakeland friends, uh, so after. After Wakeland, our project is pretty small. So uh, <laughs> purposely it's small for a couple of reasons. One, the site and its relationship to the community and our neighbors was important. And so we tried to make the project as small as possible and still make it affordable is the, not the right word, but affordable for Mr. Chima to build it. So that's a start. Um, I'd just like to walk you through it a little bit. You probably looked at it in your packets and you have questions you know the site is down the street. Um, I'm a musician, so I kind of have a heartfelt for the music process, but the site actually has an awful lot of asphalt. So we're happy to say that there's less asphalt and more landscaping after we get to build 10 units. So um, We concentrated the effort in the back of the site, and we rotated the front building so it's perpendicular to the Civic Center Drive to help with the noise and also to make the impact um, on both sides with our neighbors lessened. So each one of the units has in the gray, if you'll look to the rear of the ones in the front, they have an outdoor patio and storage area that faces our neighbors. The same in the back, they have an outdoor patio and storage area. So we tried to be sensitive to how it relates, and keeping with the height. <coughs> Excuse me a second. Um, the front building is only 24 feet tall, and the back building is only 34 feet tall because we park under. So we're trying to reduce the number of parking spaces that are visible on the site, and also keep that maximum point of landscaping. So I think this pretty shows the lime green we said it was staff recommendation that we do something the front of the site to bring the community in. So there's this area, you see sort of some tables and outdoor area that's set aside for everybody and it's still in the front yard. So we're capturing part of that. We have a trash enclosure, which is required. Here's another view from the other direction. If you took time to look at the finished materials we've tried to bring in, this sort of Spanish motif and some warm earth tone colors, I believe it's in your packet mm -hmm. and it's quite extensive. Um, the barrel roof tile would be reddish in tone, sort of 
meet the communities. The units would be accessible at grade, except in the back unit where you'd have to go up a flight of stairs to again grade, but they'd still be accessible at grade. There is a um, set aside unit on the first floor for uh, accessibility and all units on the first floor would be adaptable. So if we had for some reason a high concentration of accessible requirements, the state requires us to make them so you can make them adaptable. Is that the end of it, Mike? I guess so. So we'd uh, welcome your input. The staff has been very uh, helpful. As, as Mr. Chima mentioned, we were here before with a plan that got caught in the parking regulation change. And so that was a benefit for us, even though it set us back quite some time. So um, we'd, we'd welcome your input and I'd be happy to communicate any manner. Uh, questions before we actually go into or there a dialogue for each subject matter? Commissioner Rossler. Um, Michael indicated that uh, they were going to be apartments, so they're going to be rented? Yes. Okay. Uh, are you going to have an on-site manager? Probably not. Okay. Ten units really can't afford an on-site manager. Okay. Somebody, some renter, given that responsibility, if uh, something goes wrong. Well, there may be somebody that has. Uh, I can't speak for that. Yeah, I think what we're going to do. We had a lot of discussions with Sheriff over here too, and we had a couple of meetings, so we will have. Yeah. yeah the, uh, sorry, uh, we did have discussions. We'll have a, a property management company manage okay. the property, and then we got a lot of. Uh, input from the sheriff to make sure that, you know, we have cameras and, uh, you know, we, we attend to. Okay. And then, uh, I, I like, to your point, less than 12 units, I think, you're not required. And, yeah, I mean, it just, other thing is we're just trying to create uh, apartments which are relatively affordable in North County, so right. that was the consideration. So. Okay. Thank you. So they'll be at the, <clears throat> excuse me, the lower end of market rate kind of thing? Okay. Any other questions? And then we'll go into our uh, Commissioner Gerritsen. Uh, just a comment. In the future, it would be good if everything was from the same perspective. Yes. The first one here, it has looking at the three, three-dimensional one from Civic Center, right. and the other one looking from the other direction. And each one of them, you say, looking north, looking south, looking east, looking west. Confusing. Looking front, looking yeah. back, it became very confusing. So, you know, just a suggestion. That's why know, I love that forward. one up. Yeah. So, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Looney. Uh, just one other comment. Um, the scale of your site plan, um, you have it at 1 to 200. It's an error. And even at 1 to 20, it doesn't scale. Yes. So... There's really no way for us to evaluate the distances of what you've done. So the next submittal, if we could just make sure the scale is, sure. is correct. Thank you. I, I caught that earlier today. So. Okay. So our first uh, section to comment on is site design and grading. Any commissioners have comments? Nope. Next, oh, Commissioner Looney. I'd um, like to just give some insight on the site plan. Um, I think it might, um, I'd like to have you consider relocating the common area that has the deck and the barbecue of 466 square feet. Mm -hmm. Currently, it's, you have it set up yes. here in the plan. Um, with, Senate, with Civic Center being so busy, that would be the last place I would want to have a barbecue. I think if you brought it more to the interior of the property, it might be beneficial. Um, it, not to appear argumentative at all, just a point of information, each one of the units has a sort of a private assigned area, both 
on the side and in the back. Mm -hmm. So this was something that staff thought we needed a common area. So I'd be happy to relocate it if I can get the asphalt and the parking and the backing to work. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. It could go in interior somewhere. I think it would be better suited if yeah. it was at the interior. Um, on the um, on the very center of the um, property where you have the new parking, Mike, could you pull up the site plan? I'm in charge of this, but I don't know. There it is. Okay, that would be good. Um, the one that's in these scale. parking spaces, you've got that front bumper coming right up to the side of the building. It might be nice to create a little bit of a landscape buffer. Along the building. Because if someone jumps the curb, their foot misses the brake and hits the gas pedal, they're going right into that unit. And yes. just to, Agreed. even if it was three or four feet, it gives someone that half a second to respond correctly. And plus it just looks a whole lot better if we can get a landscape buffer in there. Agreed. Some of the areas also on the site plan, um, let's see here. This area here, there's really no, no designation as to what's taking place. It'll be landscaped. Okay. Pardon me, sir? Sorry. No. What, what kind? What, what oh, are you envisioning? Well, we haven't gotten to that stage yet. I mean, right. uh, it's, it's just, I don't think there's a plan that even shows it, other than we, in the colored elevations, it's shown as green. So we'll, we have to s submit a complete landscape plan right. with the okay. approval process. Put your barbecue back there. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, when the trash truck comes in and picks up the trash, do we have adequate size for a turnaround or does he have to back up his truck onto Civic Center? Well, it's expected every trash truck does it differently, but I would expect him to drive forward and pull into the T, if you will, mm -hmm. and then back up and then go back out. Okay, and it works. Some, some of them have helpers and some of them don't. You know, so it's, we've thought about that. If you had a hammerhead, it would work. Yes. This, I think, needs more study. Okay. And I think just one last comment um, on the site plan. It would be helpful to have a, um, a site section that shows existing grade and then proposed grade. The grading plan that has been a, made a part of the package. Was the previous you've, one. You've got, well, you've got a, the new overlaid on the existing. Okay. And it's, there's no floor to floor dimensions, so there's no, um, there's no way to really understand how high the retaining walls are going to need to be at the back portion of the property. Need, need cross sections. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Gerritsen. Uh, a clarification question. This is mixed use. Does that mean all the single family homes around are mixed use? All the properties along Civic Center are zone mixed use. Okay, so basically any property along there could do this? Uh, if it meets the, uh, the zoning requirements, that's correct in terms of density, that's right. Okay, and moving forward too, I, I would like to see what, what this property would look like compare, let's say from the perspective of each one of those homes that, that are around that, what are they gonna be looking at? They're all single family homes. Some are higher, some are same grade, what, what, what are they going to be looking at? So moving forward, I think when you come back, it would be good to have that perspective from the other properties. And a 
question for staff. What's the development rate? Because all of those are single family. Well, the majority of the lots from Santa Fe to um, Eucalyptus are residential on the west side. Mm -hmm. So as staff, what seems to be the rate of those single family, existing single family homes being converted to a multi-use structure? We've seen incremental uh, interest, I guess you would say. Um, I think there's two or three projects I know of that they're exploring their opportunities. They're, they're small properties, so I think uh, the idea of consolidating those properties, getting two or three, putting them together and being able to get the density they need to achieve you know, their economic goals. So as of right now, we've seen very limited interest, but more and more we're starting to see a little bit more in terms of uh, uh, people exploring those opportunities. But as of right now, it's not a hot topic, I guess you'd say, but we're starting to see more and more interest. Okay. So I really need to take the perspective of seeing those single family homes removed and more multi-unit or multi-use structures being along that corridor to Civic Center because the single family homes will eventually be replaced. Correct, okay. uh, incrementally, yeah. Okay, correct. thanks Mike. All right, next is architecture. Commissioner Jackal. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> one thing um, I just wanted to clarify, for each of the private patios, they are fenced from each other. Yeah. Okay. Yes. yes, they are. Yes. Okay. Um, and looking at the front elevations of the front building and the rear building, especially the front building, it seems to me that they have very characterless uh, front entrances, especially. It really almost looks like um, a motel where you just you, you've just got the doors that open into the into the room. Um, then the west elevation of the rear building above the covered parking um, is also very bland and needs some architectural details, in my opinion. See right above the, the covered parking canopy or whatever, that, that's just kind of a blank wall with windows punched in it. Commissioner Rossler, architecture. Um, the, the plans seem to indicate that, uh, that at least on the front building, uh, the elevation, I believe this is the elevation that fronts on, um, on Civic Center. Yes. Uh, on the left-hand side, we're seeing, a, I, I think, a gate um, or is that the, the storage facility? Let's go. There. On the right-hand side right. of the, the lower elevation. I think on elevation number two, which is the front of the building here, I think what is the drawing in the back there is the trash enclosure. Okay. With some architect uh, the, architecture the, and on stuff the top, on it. Yeah. On the top elevation, I agree. Yeah. On the bottom elevation, though, the, the right there. Yes. Thank you, Gary. Um, or Michael. Um, it's, it's just way back. Is that is that the storage unit for the the unit, or is that the uh, the fenced off area for the patio? Anyway, here's my concern. It didn't look like it had a roof structure on it right. or roof tiles, and I would pr you have it on several of the others throughout the project. I'd prefer to see that on, on that one also. Um, the entrances, um, 
I know there's projection on the second story that, that go out over some of the entrances. Yes. But some of the entrances don't have anything covering them. And uh, it would be important to me to have some type of cover Step out of the rain. Exactly. All right. And then uh, on your, all your patios, uh, are you going to have some type of shade structure on the open patios, both on the upper building and the lower building? Hadn't intend to, but it may be an economic goal okay. approach. All right. They tend to be a maintenance problem. Because uh, people put a barbecue underneath them, and then the next thing you know, they get all full of soot. Yep. So. Um, I understand that. Uh, I, but I think uh, the residents uh, would enjoy having shade out there if they're sitting outside. So uh, somehow dealing with that. So those are my comments on architecture. Commissioner Bell. Thank you. Um, just a comment on the, the lower level layout of the units. I think the, the current preference in construction is not to divide up rooms so much. I know you're really limited on space here, but you've got the kitchen dividing up between your dining room and your living area with the kitchen in the middle. Um, honestly, this is different than what I'm seeing on the, uh, the plans we have. So is the, the one I'm seeing right now has the kitchen with an open bar, is that right? Yes. Then that's what I was gonna suggest. The, the, one, yes. the one on the original layout was probably a little more div divided. So this is the layout I was gonna suggest in my ultimate wisdom, clearly with all my years of architectural experience and watching HGTV all day long in my house. <laughs> my um, wife's addicted to it. But, but I would say, I mean, it, it, this is a lot more attractive as far as having an open space. Um, it, it, when you're in a small unit as it is, being able to use the entire downstairs without walls dividing the room is a big deal. We, we tried to make sure that there was uh, windows on both ends. Yeah. And, you know, the boxcar routine is pretty tough, but sticking with the, the site limitations and then the size of the units. I, I think this is a great design right here. I would highly recommend this over the original layout that you had in the plans. Commissioner Looney. So were you referring to the first floor plan? Yes. Where the kitchen is in the middle of the dining and the living room? Correct, and that's probably the miniaturized plans I saw where the kitchen divides the dining room and the living room with a wall in between. And I understand you're limited by the refrigerator and the oven. You know, there's certain things you can't float in the middle of the, the room, but I think what you have up here is much preferable if you can get something that opens up with an open kitchen like that. People sit where the TV is and where food's in reach. So, Well, efficiency living is something that I've been doing for about 30 years, and, and we're still, um, I had some empathy about the size of the units mm -hmm. for the seniors, but, but you can do it, and if you get light air and ventilation, yeah. it actually is quite nice. Good. So this floor plan isn't the one that was in the packet then? Should have been. I think the pro well, this project's gone through a few renditions. Um, as the architect indicated, when changes were made to the mixed use standard, the site plans changed, and uh, there's been modifications to the project. So the packet that's before you might have uh, um, inconsistent plans, I guess, compared to what's the proposal before you tonight. So that might be the reason why. Okay. Um, I think it's real important when you submit next time that we have a comprehensive set of drawings because the floor plan that I have, it doesn't work because I'm walking in on the dining room and then I got to walk past the kitchen to get to the living room. That doesn't work. Um, one of the other things, I don't have any cross sections of the building that show floor to floor. So on the floor plan, on the packet, your floor plan shows 15 risers. So if we go at seven and a half inch risers, you've got about a nine foot four from floor to floor. But then you've tucked this powder bath underneath the stair. And when you take the height of that riser into that ceiling space, it doesn't work. Okay. So let's just be mindful of some of those dimensions. Again, if we had more information on the drawings relative to heights. 
it really helps things. Um, one of the other things that was brought up on the previous um, project, it was stated that Civic Center is the main street coming in to downtown. This building needs to be, needs to have a lot more embellishments in order for it, for it to meet that standard. Um, it doesn't, it's not something that I think the city of Vista and the residents would want to see as they come in to visit the city. It needs to have that wow effect. We need to have something that is gonna draw our attention in a positive light rather than how did this get built. Um, I know I'm being critical, but I'm very concerned about what I see when I come into downtown. And I think um, the massing is, is okay, but we just need to add some embellishments to make it look attractive. Uh, one, of, one last comment. Um, in the back building, you've got some columns um, that are about 30 feet apart for parking. And that's not a, it's a stretch. difficult span if you're using steel or glue lamb beams. Right, this is still a stretch. Um, so with a 30 foot span with two floors above it, you're probably looking at a 24 inch glue lamb or piece of steel that's 18 inches to 20 inches deep. So just give that some consideration uh, as you reevaluate um, the design. That's all, thank you. Mm -hmm. Student commissioner, you have some comments? Please come up. Thank you. Um, I agree with Commissioner Looney about the embellishments. Uh, I think that it architecturally it looks nice, but the colors are a bit of an eyesore, in my opinion. Um, the brown green, I, that color just doesn't really sit well with me. There's a lemon color, which looks nicer. Um, that's the lemon color, and it looks nicer, but the green, I don't like that color, okay. and I don't think it really fits with the, the downtown. Um, just, yeah, it doesn't fit with the downtown, and um, as Commissioner Looney said, we want like that extra punch factor, yep. and color is definitely something that factors into that. Perfect, thank you. I think this is a classic case of the computer and who prints it and who, who processes it. You know, even, even when we do this, I think, did we submit this in the material sample board? Yeah. So th they'll hold our feet to the fire when we come back. Yeah. Share that with our student commissioner behind you. I don't think he's seen that. You know, every copy of your print is a different color. Commissioner Gerritsen, please. Yes. Um, I have a question about what people are going to see as they go up uh, Civic Center Drive relative to the garage, because this shows a plain wall at, at the back of the garage. And my question is, are people gonna store stuff there? Is that going to be a catch-all? And is it gonna be an eyesore for, as you drive up Civic Center to see the cars parked and all the junk inside that, uh, that garage? I don't think you can see the garage from the street or the sidewalk, because there'll be a gradual change going up and then looking back, you'll see parked cars, but it's a long ways back there. Well, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't erase the concern that it could look junky based on what you put in the garage and how you, how you do the architecture there. And if, if there's a riser up there, that makes it even, instead of being lower than eye level, it's higher than eye level and it's easier to see if that's a higher elevation than Civic Center Drive, which it is. <laughs> Excuse me. So I would be concerned about what, what you're gonna see in those garages when there's no car there or even when a car is there in terms of what's at the, uh, uh, the end of that, that garage. With, 
preliminarily looking at the plans, uh, they've identified uh, storage uh, cabinets for each unit, so they're not proposing uh, storage above the, uh, the carport covered parking area. So with those being shown, I'm assuming it would just be a flat wall and you wouldn't have storage in front of the parking. And you would not have story. You would not have storage in front. If, nope. if if I pull my car in there, and, and even if there's a garage there, I'm going to maybe put storage in between, outside of the uh, the shelves or outside of the uh, storage I, area. I don't think the intention was putting shelves there. I think, and and you can see on this uh, perspective here on the uh, north west corner uh, of the project, you can see the tiled roof with the two doors. Those are storage cabinets that, and maybe the owner of the, the project will uh, uh, provide more comment, but those are the ideas. They would have lockers, each one of them, and they would have their storage there and not adjacent to the parking area, but, and he might be able to explain that So you're on that saying the garage would go to a blank wall? It wouldn't. No well, it's, there's no garage doors. This is just covered parking. So, um, yeah. And yeah, if I, mean, you I think this is all open, so that's not the intent to have them store. And we had looked at earlier, but then you know, with the design, we had to do separate storage. So, uh, okay. yeah, we don't expect residents to. Uh, well, I think it has the perspective of looking junky. Where there people store stuff there, that they they're concerned about security or not, they may store stuff there, and there's got to be a way that you can stop that, the eyes from going to that as you're going up Civic Center, because that's going to be a higher elevation. So you're going to look right into those garages. So yeah, I think, that would yeah, be we'll, a concern. Yeah, we'll look at that, and then as, you know, uh, the, the policy uh, for the, you know, tenants that, you know, we'll, we'll make sure. And yeah, we got some good ideas from the sheriff uh, people to make sure that, you know, we don't have stuff laying around. It's uh, laying around and crime, you know, so I think we, those two meetings with the staff was very helpful. You know, we had sheriff on both occasions, so. Commissioner Bell. Thank you. Just to offer something positive, I like the concept, whether it's intended or not, of the feel of this being a, a multi-elevation house from the street. If you're driving by at a speed or you're going by at a decent pace, it really strikes me, especially from the, the picture looking up at the street, that this would be just a very large house. So whatever you can do in terms of the comments you've already heard to make it feel from the street like a, a residential house as opposed to a apartment with open garages and everything else, I think you've got an advantage here because people are looking uphill. I think there's a little bit of an elevation change. So at a glance, you can do something nice with the outside here and make it attractive. Um, and I mean that as a compliment. I think you've got something good to work with here, so. Commissioners, parking and traffic. Commissioner Jackal. Okay, thank you. Um, looking at the uh, site plan, I see uh, something that is marked accessible path that goes along the front of the front building. I can't tell from this plan whether that accessible path reaches down to the public sidewalk. I believe the code requires to provide a pedestrian access that's accessible to the public right-of-way, which would be the sidewalk. Okay, so that's fine. But then, once you're in front of the um, front building, where is the pedestrian sidewalk that gets you to the rear building? There isn't necessarily a dedicated sidewalk. So you'd have to walk across the driveway. Is there any way to put in a specific sidewalk? I think that you could probably potentially go along that 
south property line, you know, this open area that they referred to, that the landscaping you were concerned about, mm -hmm. maybe potentially coming back that direction, maybe doing something here, maybe adjusting that a bit. I'm not sure, but it's kind of tight here with the parking and so forth, so I don't know if there's any opportunity without adjusting the plan, but maybe you could do something along that edge and bring yeah. it up and take a look at that. I was just... We could do... We could look at that. Thank you. All right. Uh, Commissioner Gerritsen. Yes, and other... Um other properties where we've had those concerns that put pavers across. So that might be a solution too. Yes. Put pavers across the driveway. Well, we haven't finished the development of the drainage plan, but a lot of times you, we can use permeable pavers in a lot of places and that really helps the drainage issue. Um, and we would recommend that. And it, it's, it's go that permeable pavers are actually running almost even with asphalt now. So the less asphalt, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Landscape and amenities. Commission, Commissioner Jackal. Okay. Um, I will be very interested in seeing the landscape plan when you come back. Um, I know we've just had discussion here this evening about moving that barbecue area. Great. Is there going to be any place for uh, kids to play? There is not a, at this time a designated play area because of security with kids. So it was sort of expected in offering the private yards in each one of the units that we would not have young people running around in the parking lot and that kind of stuff. No, that's, that's my concern, yeah. is playing in the, in the parking lot. Okay, um, now, to me, with respect, looking at the, the slide that's up there right now, um, that, to me, also looks like a lot of asphalt. And I'm wondering if there's any way along the um, where is that? I guess it is north and south property lines. Mm -hmm. Can we put a, a strip of landscaping along each property line? Just yes. To, just to soften it to make it look more, um, less like a parking lot. Or a driveway. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Rossler. I was just going to say that Commissioner Looney's comments earlier about moving the barbecue area were uh, very appropriate. So um, that's something. And you've said you're going to look at that. So yes. That. And Marlene Fossil, Fossilman, do you want to come forward and provide your comments? My name is Marlene Fosselman. <clears throat> Excuse me, I haven't spoken a little bit. I live at 612 Crest Drive, directly behind this apartment complex. My picture's up on the screen there, my house. I was on the west of you, if you want to put it back there with this. I think it's the Well, it was there. I think it said the west view. I mostly have just a bunch of questions about it, let's see. I lived directly behind this for 29 years. So will there be a good wall, not a cheap fence between this apartment building and my home? Um, the lighting, I've never heard anybody mention anything about lights. Um, are there going to be balconies facing my property? Like directly over my fence area? Um, it, with so many people in this uh, small of a piece of property, even it's 0.4 acres, but that's not very big for 10 units. Um, and there's, are all the units two bedrooms? So how many people would be equivalent 
in all those units and who's to say that only two people are gonna be living there. Sometimes you see people at apartment complexes, uh, complexes and there's like 10 or 15 cars parked in the front for one unit. Um, are people allowed to park in the back? And what about the drainage and the runoff? Like, um, and how many feet is my yard from the building wall? So, I mean, those, there's a lot of questions that I have because like I said, I'm directly behind you. See the house there with the gray roof? That's me. I, I'm not certain if anybody here is um, in those other uh, units on the other side, but um, I just, my house is a little bit of distance from it, but I still don't want, uh, you know, no, that's not my house. It's this directly behind it, no. Directly to the west. 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 Yeah, right, no, over, right there. there. You go. Yeah, I have no swimming pool. <laughs> So anyways, that's me. I've been there for 29 years. Um, I mean, I've seen that, that place go from the music school to a regular house, and now it's gonna be 10 units, I don't know. It's kind of a lot in that uh, area. So I'm, I just, th those are just my questions, and I don't know if, if I can contact your company about them or you'll send me a letter or how it all works, but so I don't want these questions to go unanswered. I can answer some of that. Um, okay. The purpose of the meeting tonight is to get feedback from the commission and from the neighbors about concerns about the project. So we've noted all those concerns. This project still has to go through a design review and a staff process before it comes back for a formal public hearing like we had for the project earlier. So there's probably a few months of time here that we're gonna be working with the applicant to try to resolve some of the issues that were raised tonight. Michael Ressler, the gentleman right there to your right, is the planner that's assigned to the project. He can give you his information, and then when they come back in with the resubmittal, okay. we can set up a time to meet with you and go through all that. Okay, so, and then one, one last question. Since I am directly behind the unit, is it a different kind of a situation than the people that are on the sides of the unit? In other words, do you have different rights than yeah. someone? No. Okay. Okay, so I'll take your card. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Maple and um, For Mr. Sure. Ressler, did you get everything you needed from us? Yeah, I think uh, there's some solid direction there. You know, uh, I just want to make sure everybody's aware of the fact that uh, this project will not go before you when it goes through entitlement. It's actually uh, based on the uh, zoning code. Uh, uh, projects uh, with 10 units and below would go before the zoning administrator. However, uh, you'd be notified of that and if there was any concern or so forth, it could be called up for review and brought to you uh, uh, after that decision. It's appealable to the Planning Commission. Right. Okay, perfect. All right. Mr. Ham, come on down. Stephanie, you have a question or? Yes, please. Um, Mr. Ressler, in that case, then, if I wanted to see the landscape plan, um, how would I do that? Uh, once the, uh, the project's been, uh, 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 the staff report and, and uh, resolution and so forth has been put together, you could easily make an appointment with me to come down. I can roll the plans out, as well as the adjacent neighbor. Uh, we could set some time up. You could take a look at the drawings. Um, we could even do that earlier than later um, and make sure you're fully aware of what they're proposing and, okay. and make sure that it meets the expectations of the Planning Commission. All right, thank you. I'd like to do that. And so would you sort of let me know when it's to that point? And I'll be happy to make an appointment. Most definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you'll get the notice. Mr. Ham, come on up. I'll be here. Sure. Oh. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Kevin Ham. I'm director of economic development. 
So nice to have Mr. Stone next to me. He is my right hand when it comes to legal issues, so it's great to have him here. So uh, thank you for having me this evening. Um, I will try to go through quickly what we do in economic development, because I think some of the things that you want to talk about relate more to the downtown and what's going on in the downtown. Um, also here this evening uh, is Andrew Peterson with Cushman Wakefield. He's the broker for DDR, uh, which is Vista Village. So if you have specific questions of what's going on in Vista Village, he'll be able to answer some of those. In economic development, uh, the definition is really improving the economic well-being of a community. And, and by, by the way, this is only a four-hour presentation. Is that okay? <laughs> All right, little levity. <laughs> sure, questions. So um, I kind of like to have an elevator speech, but what we do in economic development is we retain we expand, we assist, uh, and we're the ombudsman for companies. Uh, we attract companies here, both in, our, in the industrial office and retail arena, and then we work the regional, state, uh, wide level on economic development strategies. And I like to say we get them, keep them, help them. Um, that's what we do. So when someone asks, that's what we do in economic development. So we have a lot of strategies that we focus on, and I'm going to go through these first few quickly. Um, some of you may know this. We have a Vista Cares program where the mayor, a council member, the city manager, Mr. Conley, myself, will go out monthly, meet with companies to understand them, to let them know that there are people in the city that want to understand what their needs are, to meet them face to face if an issue comes up, if they're looking at expanding. Uh, maybe calling Mr. Conley and finding out what they need to do. If they're looking for some assistance with distribution or a new space, we can help them with that. We also have a business walk um, that I know uh, Commissioner Gerritsen has been on and maybe some other of you have been on as well. And then we stay in close contact with property owners. Uh, we also have um, a single point of contact in the city. So if there's an issue, challenge, something that comes up, uh, people will come to us, uh, and then that allows us to have a conversation with different departments to see if we can get um, clarity on the issue and move something forward. We have recently implemented facade improvement program. This helps in a lot of different ways in areas that have um, challenging facades, uh, both from a property owner perspective or a visual perspective. We're able to go out and assist in improving the facade. Um, that helps us in a couple of different ways from a code enforcement perspective. If it's something that someone's unable to do, our code enforcement team will let us know. We'll go out. And then in the downtown, many of those facades have been improved with a program like this. We also work on business support legislation on issues that will assist businesses in our community. There we go. Uh, we work on office and industrial attraction opportunities within the community. We focus on different types of uses in the business park. Our business park now consists of 14 million square feet, 1,600 um, uh, acres. We also have um, probably about 900 companies that employ about 24,000 people, and the economic impact alone in that business park, just from salaries alone, is about a half billion dollars. Uh, and so we have companies that do a business across the world, and it's an amazing business park. And so we work to bring companies in there, assist companies in growing and helping them stay within the business park. Uh, we've worked with most, Mr. Conley and his team in the past and also with the planning commissioner to uh, amend the specific plan in the business park. Over time, that business park has become more of an office park, a corporate headquarters, more than in its initial stages in the past was more of kind of a warehouse as well as a distribution center. And we've seen that with a lot of companies. For example, talking about companies, San Diego's largest privately held company you may know is in our Vista Business Park, that's DJO. We also work at the regional and state level. Uh, examples include we've uh, implemented the Innovate 78 program. The most recent success of that is something called Global Tire. Uh, investment of $3 million and about 30 jobs here in our city. And that's something that uh, we just were able to put on the ground in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we also work at the state level. Uh, myself, I'm chair of a statewide organization. We work with the governor's office and the legislator to implement programs that will support business. Um, we have a staff that oversees these programs. Um, it's me and one other person. 
Um, as uh, Commissioner Jackal will attest, we used to have four people and now we have two. Uh, we just do about the same thing with fewer people now. Uh, but we have get them, keep them, help them jobs. Uh, Mr. Luna on my staff focuses on downtown issues. What I wanted to take you through is an example of a retail recruitment here, and I'm sorry this is so small and I'll read it to you. That first box there was uh, we were working with a company early on when we started working with breweries, and we thought there might be um, some legs to this industry that could provide value to our downtown and our business park. We started working with a group called Middleton Brewery. That did not work out. Uh, but we spent some time with them, um, upwards of nine months to a year. And then you might remember Dell's, which uh, some of you might have gone to that restaurant. Uh, he needed to move out of the shopping center that was down in East Vista Way. We worked with him for about nine months. Uh, and this specific location is eventually where Mother Earth went in the downtown. So about a year passed. Uh, we couldn't make anything work with him. We were trying to use redevelopment dollars to assist him with locating him in that location. That didn't work out. Uh, then we came up with a crazy idea uh, to put Mother Earth in there that turned out to be a really good crazy idea. And uh, it took us about another year to get Mother Earth in there. And there's a lot of different parties that we work with to finally get them into a space. But in the end, there are a lot of different parties that help move it to the finish line. This example here shows um, in the very beginning, I think people didn't realize the value of breweries. So as staff, we're convincing the city manager and others that this is something that we might try. So the city manager was involved in that, uh, the planning department. We also had law enforcement involved because of what's the difference between a brewery and a bar, right? I think all of us know that now, but it wasn't apparent at the time. We also work with um, redevelopment and the city attorney to draft an agreement because the reason we took over that space in the downtown was specifically because a Chinese fast food, all you can eat buffet was gonna go in there. And we decided we wanted to hold that piece of property because it was in a critical location and we thought it could be a better use. So working with the city attorney's office and redevelopment, we then relinquished that lease and transferred that to Mr. Dan Love, who's the owner of Mother Earth. We worked with the VVBA in the chamber after convincing them that that was a good idea to help us have convinced the community and then ultimately the business opened. So this is kind of an example. Everyone has a different path, but there's a lot of paths to get to the finish line. So have you heard about Urge in San Marcos? So you know we had that here first. So what happened was we worked with them for three years and it was gonna go in the Bally's location. We actually came up with that entire design. See this design? You could almost take this with a couple of alterations and lay it down at the Urge in San Marcos. And three months away from breaking ground, we actually had the property owner and the property manager negotiate different terms with Urge. And because they didn't agree, got in a lawsuit and, and pulled them in. So um, he kind of hightailed it and looked for another location. So you can work long and hard to have something work and at the finish line, sometimes it doesn't happen. But I tell my friends in San Marcos that they owe us for that one. <laughs> so talking about uh, current uses that are looking in the downtown, um, we have in the former uh, El Cajon place, uh, maybe uh, Andrew can talk a little bit about that, but we have a lease in final stages for a restaurant going in that location. Uh, 230 Main Street, which is the former 50 Barrels location, um, and we actually convinced Cam to change those locations, the building owner, to something else. When Pigs Fly, I think you guys have seen that. Uh, 20 Main Street, the former Subway, is gonna be a Pokey Pokey um, location. 35 Main Street is a martial arts fitness studio. 306 South Santa Fe, we have worked with probably no less than 10 uses to go into that space. Um, and any number of reasons why things haven't worked out, but there's been about 10 different folks that have looked at that. Is that Paseo Santa Fe? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, that's the site South that's Santa at Fe. the roundabout that was the old uh, Gill's feed. I think it was the building. Yeah. yeah. And that's a beautiful space if you've seen it. Uh, 227 Broadway, um, as we talked about, Commissioner, um, that that's going to be a doghouse. A restaurant. If you haven't seen that, they have a couple of them open. It's kind of a higher end sausage and um, craft beer location. Um, 
we also have a Pets Plus pet supply that we'll be opening up in the near future in between Fraser Farms and the Crunch Fitness. 303 Vista Village Drive and the former famous Dave's so Raising Canes is going in there. Uh, interestingly enough, there's probably going to be more traffic coming through that site um, to that location than, and producing more sales tax than the former famous Dave's. This business has quite a following, so it'll bring a lot of eyeballs into the downtown that can shop at some of our other businesses. And I know the VVBA is working, the Vista Village Business Association, working on taking advantage of that. 204 Main Street, uh, Mother Earth is working in their former homebrew store on a kind of higher end craft beer, wine, and deli in that location. They're in the process right now of making the improvements in that site. Uh, in the former Back to Basic site, there's a gym. Um, that's a recent occurrence that's happened. 631 South Santa Fe, the former build, burned out building uh, next to the attorney uh, Guribe Lopez. Uh, there's going to be a tasting room called Guadalupe Brewing going into that location. Uh, 131 Main Street, uh, which is the former Off-Broadway Youth Theater. Uh, we have been working with an independent coffee roaster. Uh, that deal right now may not move forward, but we think that that would be a creative, interesting use for the downtown, kind of keeping with the Vista's image of city of makers and craft being important to us. And then in the Walgreens space, we had uh, and have tried to work with a specialty grocer in that location. Those discussions continue at this time. 330 Main Street, the former uh, Art Beat on Main Street, we have a sushi restaurant that is in the process of purchasing that building. Um, they have not closed on the purchase yet, but that is moving forward, and I expect that that will happen. Two Trend Broadway, uh, which is the former January Girls, is going to become an organic natural food deli. 230 Broadway, um, this is interesting because we have straight edge shaving. He's got a vacant space next door. He actually has the lease signed and has had it for a year, but has not had the time to move the shaving business to the bigger location and then open up a shaving store. Again, kind of with that craft idea of shaving. Uh, we've been working with a gelato shop in the downtown. And then one point I wanted to point out, um, and we also mentioned this to council, is that some of these uses, and I know when some of the questions came up, was near the end of the year. And at the end of the year, a lot of the retailers and restaurants are really doing what they try to do best at that time of year is sell. They also were waiting for um, the outcome a lot of a lot of the residential um, developments because, you know, the retail and restaurants follow rooftops. And so they wanted to see where the city was going with that. They wanted to see the outcome of the council. And so with that, a lot of them had a positive feeling and had moved forward. So the big questions, I think there are a lot of them. And today it was very interesting. Um, I received um, from someone who's an investment banker an email out of the blue that talked about REITs in the retail world. It says, buy every other type of REIT, but not in retail. Uh, at the same time, the Kiplinger letter today, the entire front page is about the changing nature of retail. Entire front page. Got in the car at 5 o'clock, went to go get some dinner. NPR story on retail. Did you hear that? Yeah. So, you know, in all of the arenas of um, real estate, especially in the commercial world, I see retail as one of these continually evolving and, and most certainly change, quickly changing. Uh, when it comes to the Internet's impact um, on stores, malls, downtowns, and communities, we try to stay ahead of that uh, and understand where things are going. Um, there are also, what are the next dis disruptors? And what I mean by that is Amazon was a disruptor. They came into the space. They changed the way people bought things. But did you guys see in the last couple of days, now um, Amazon has this new device. They had the Alexa. Now they have the uh, Amazon, I believe it's View or Look. So you can actually set it up, and this you don't only talk to it, it will see you and tell you whether or not the outfit you're wearing is good and compares it to other ones. Well, where I see this disruptor going is 20% of the marketplace on online sales is clothing. Well, these devices are gonna quickly tell you what is the best outfit you can wear and sell it to you. So I think this is gonna be a disruptor in the marketplace. And, and we kind of laugh when we think about it, 
but I think it's something that's going to be coming. Uh, what do consumers want? We're finding that consumers want experiences more than stuff. I think that's one of the reasons the breweries have been so successful. It's a place where you can go, you can talk, you can be, you can play a game. So we're finding that retailers are creating uh, and looking for spaces where they not only can sell stuff, but they can also create an environment where people want to go. So what do we put in retail when it becomes vacant? Um, entertainment is important. Um, we're seeing rec recreation come in. We're seeing Doctail, which is Dr. Retail. So all of us now see it. You know, you go in and you go to the Smile Center. You never thought of seeing a dentist before in a retail location, but you're seeing that, right? Uh, Pop-up retail, especially around the holidays. There's been some ones that we've seen in the past, uh, but there are new ones that are coming out. Um, entertainment retail, schools, and other things are out there too. So really the response to that is really to stay informed, stay flexible, stay involved. We participate in the International Council of Shopping Centers. We work with brokers and owners closely. We work with retailers. We read anything that we can uh, to see where the market might be going, and we work with state and national organizations. So that is it for me. Like I said, I also have here uh, Andrew Peterson, who is the um, new proud father, parent of twins. So if he's looking tired, he's looking more tired than I am, but this is his adult time this evening. Uh, but he is also here if you have any questions specifically to DEDR and what they're doing and what's taking place. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Uh, any questions, commissioners? Commissioner Gerritsen? Uh, Kevin, give us an update on Innovate 78, wh wh where that's headed and what you believe have been some of the accomplishments and whether that's been a, a good focus for the city of Vista, not so much for the 78 quarter, but for the city of Vista. Sure. Do you all know what Innovate 78 is? So let, let me take a step back and then tell you. Innovate 78 is a five city partnership for economic development. So the first step in that um, process was really to create recognition of the brand. There are five different cities that provide different value, right? So when you locate in Carlsbad, um, the value of locating there, the amenities, is going to be different than Vista, which is different than Escondido. So we realized that by working together, we could have a full slate of different options available to people. So it's helped Vista in a couple of different ways. Um, we have a vacancy rate in our business park, and primarily this is industrial and office focused, not retail focused. Uh, of only 3%. And so we have companies that employ people in our community. The last time we did a survey, 30% of the people who live in Vista work in Vista. But as those companies grow, and I kind of call it the sand crab syndrome, right? The sand crab grows, it needs to find a new shell. Same thing happens with our companies. They need to find a new location to go. And if I only have a 3% vacancy rate, I'm going to lose that company to somewhere outside of this area and I want to make sure it stays here and keeps those individuals connected to this community, living in this community. So we've seen lots of success of keeping companies here as well as bringing companies in. Uh, one company which was the first that we've talked about before is Dr. Bronner's. Dr. Bronner's um, took about 135,000 square feet at 1335 Park Center Drive. Um, they sell their products across the globe great recognition for the community of that product. But the most recent one is Global Tire, uh, working both with the governor's office as well as Innovate 78. Uh, we were able to get that $3 million investment and 30 jobs in the community. Um, we have and are in the process of transitioning from uh, more about communication and working together to make sure people know that um, if they come to me and I can't help them, we're going to make sure that they get assistance along the corridor, which companies really want to know. But we're also transitioning to a program where uh, I would call it more of the um, nuts and bolts of economic development, where we're implementing a, a referral program, realizing that some of our best customers, new customers, come from our existing customers. We're going to be involving the CEOs and leaders of our companies in talking to them about who can we bring to this community that would either be in their same space or support their industry? And so we're getting close to rolling that out as well. Commissioner Rossler. 
Uh, two questions, uh, traffic and mixed use. Uh, I, just from observation, I believe that a lot of the folks that work in our, our business park travel north to Fallbrook, Temecula, Marietta to, to live, and that's created problems on East Vista Way going out of town, uh, Buena Creek and uh, Sycamore uh, offset, and people trying to get out uh, uh, Buena Creek Road to Twin Oaks, uh, and then 78. Um, where, where do you guys fit in in trying to get those traffic problems solved? Because it seems to me that they were they were generated from our business park. That's where where folks are living. So uh, that's the first one. Uh, the second one is is where are we in mixed use? Uh, seem to be struggling to get uh, commercial uses into our true mixed use projects with the ground floor commercial. So yeah. So two very different questions. Let me take a shot at both of them. So Innovate seventy eight actually. Um, kind of came together when economic development staff was working together and realized we needed to work together and the mayors were at SANDAG talking about traffic and transportation issues. So the issue of um, resolving some of those transportation issues I think is core as part of Innovate 78. Uh, when we did our last survey and we're in the process of updating some of that information now, we found that the majority of people who worked in the business park lived in Vista, Escondido, and Oceanside. Really? Yes. And so um, we haven't updated that information since we did our business industry analysis in 2009. So we're in the process of looking at updating that information right now. When it comes to mixed use, what I find is um, depending upon the type of mixed use, um, let's say it's affordable housing, there's a need for that affordable housing right now. But the commercial may not be ripe to develop now, but you've got to develop the commercial because it's attached to it, right? So sometimes that property stays vacant for a while until the market matures enough to actually come into that space. So it's sometimes what I suggest is looking at horizontal mixed use. You know, go back to the old plan where right next door, you know, I might have a two, three-story complex with retail underneath, and maybe you take that same site, you move the retail off to one side, it matures at a different time, and then you're able to put the housing on the ground, still controlled and connected in some way. Uh, but that's something that I've seen some other cities do. Mr. Connolly, do you want to weigh in or? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, Commissioner Jackal? I don't have a question, but I do want to say how exciting uh, what is, is happening in the downtown is. It really is great to see. So three cheers. Commissioner Connolly. I wouldn't want Andrew to come all the way down here and not have a couple questions to answer, so I have a couple questions for him. <clears throat> the first one is um, the theater remodel that's occurred with uh, Sinopolis. I know that they've changed their seating capacity. How has that affected the retail environment within the center in a positive or negative way? Uh, I think Kevin's got maybe more dialogue with Sinopolis directly than I do, but I do know that the anticipation of a Sinopolis as a brand um, and how that relates to their success in La Costa and Del Mar uh, from an ownership standpoint, from a, from a marketing standpoint on the leasing side has been nothing but positive. Um, like I think Kevin had more occupancy and, and uh, and uh, the seat remodel uh, information than I probably do. But um, I think by and large, as, uh, as we look at Vista Village on a whole, we still try and promote the fact that it's a, it's a lifestyle center, pedestrian oriented, closely tied to uh, the community and the, the wave water park and the, and the surrounding areas. And I think that Sinopolis as a brand is, is synonymous with, with lifestyle in a higher end uh, uh, evening experiential uh, retail compared to its uh, the, the former movie theater. Okay. And, Kevin, and while Andrew's up there, I might say that, you know, the partnership with brokers and especially Andrew is uh, very important. And he's been a great team member um, working with him. As a matter of fact, uh, with that one um, use that we're talking about in the former El Cajon location, um, communicating back and forth and the needs that he has that we can help him with and vice versa. And so 
I just want to recognize him and how helpful that he's been to help us achieve some of those needs. As it relates to Sinopolis, I was talking to their, some of their senior staff. Um, they said that they are um, getting close to some of their higher, uh, if not highest, occupancy numbers. Uh, as you might know, they had 3,000 seats in that theater, and now they have 1,500. They essentially cut it in half for the higher end seats. Uh, but they're finding that they're getting them filled. And as part of that, um, they have their 40X theater, which is one of only four, I understand, in, in California. Uh, they have their children's Sinopolis, um, uh, Sinopolis Jr. Uh, but they said they're within 5% of the Regal Theater in Carlsbad, uh, and they expect to surpass them anytime soon. Um, we are working with them to uh, have um, alcohol service in the theater. Uh, and that will also, I would imagine, boost sales and attendance at that location. So I have one more question. When we did the zoning for the downtown specific plan, we looked at the Vista Village Center and tried to make sure that we incorporated a range of uses that we thought would be beneficial for the project. Um, as the market evolves, are there land uses that we should be looking at or considering to amend the downtown plan to allow for or allow for through use permit to make it easier to fill some of those spaces? Uh, generally speaking, I think the city's been fairly supportive of every use that we've brought forward. Um, I, I, you know, I don't want to say anything too controversial in terms of uses that were more acceptable than others. Obviously, the Raising Canes got approved, and we're going from a sit-down restaurant to a drive through uh, but in exchange, as, as Kevin pointed out, I think it's going to be a tremendous destination and draw for the center. Uh, we we uh, incorporated the, the martial arts use. Uh, again, I think that ties in nicely with the fact that it's a community center and, and uh, there can be a, a collaboration of the different types of consumers that come there. Um, in terms of things that the city can do to support our efforts, uh, I, frankly, I think you guys have done a fantastic job. I think Vista on a whole is, is, is incredibly um, cooperative and, and easy to work with, uh, both with planning and with the economic development. Um, I could give you some small examples, and, and Kevin may not want to mention the specific name of the restaurant we're dealing with on the El Cajon, but it's Swami's Cafe, and we're excited about that use because they've had a lot of success in North County. Um, both in Escondido and then in Oceanside. Those are, uh, uh, Escondido's their third best restaurant and Oceanside's now their first best restaurant, restaurant despite being in Encinitas for, for over 20 years. So we're excited because I think, again, it brings a healthy, hip, you know, uh, nouveau type concept to the area that's totally different than everything else that we have going on. So, um, no, um, I, uh, we're content. It's just it, it, like a lot of centers and like a lot of areas in North County, uh, we oftentimes, as soon as we can fill something, it, it, another vacancy pops up. But um, I mean, just to speak, and, and then some of them were noted on the, the board. I mean, in the last, uh, I think I've been on the project about 25, 26 months now, and the first six months were slow. But since then, in the last 16 months, I think we've taken the vacancy from 18% to 10.5%. Uh, Pets Plus was a huge win to, uh, because it's a, a large, awkwardly shaped space, and it's going to be a fantastic uh, uh, addition to our uh, our tenancy. And then, I think with Swami's, uh, Pokey, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, we're, we toured Jamba Juice this week. I've got several different uh, newer type uh, QSR quick serve restaurant concepts that we've toured, uh, and then. Um, there's also, for what it's worth, and I'm glad they're not here, but for what it's worth, DDR had a, a large leadership change recently. They were acquired, and since then, uh, I, can't, I can speak volumes of how uh, more cooperative and helpful they've been in getting leases done. Even, even in the most, you know, four or five months, there's been a huge change in, in their just, you know, proactiveness to getting things done. So I think uh, so far, so good. Commissioner Rassler? Any thoughts on why we lost uh, the restaurants down there, Famous Dave's, the uh, California Pizza Kitchen, uh, Subway? I think uh, there's probably not an overarching general comment that, that will explain why they all left. I think there's a specific story behind a lot of them. I know Famous Dave is probably front and center for the city's 
uh, standpoint. And I think, unfortunately, which, which happens a lot in our industry, um, prices are at all-time high. The building sold uh, at, a, at an all-time high price. And when the lease came up to justify that high price, the new owner tried to jack up the rent. And uh, it was uh, apparently, I wasn't involved. It's, uh, it's a, not a DDR asset. Um, I was involved with the Raising Canes because I represent them in, in San Diego County. But uh, the, the, my understanding is that the famous Dave uh, could not afford the rent that the landlord required in light of, to, to make his return or, or to, to justify the price he had spent. And, and frankly, the, the market for large sit-down restaurants across the county as well as North County, is, it's not tremendous. It's the, the Elephant Bar in, in San Marcos is vacant, the, Ol the Olive Garden in Escondido is vacant, and they've, they've both been on the market for eight plus months, and it's, it's tough. We're having to reinvent space, split space, multi, you know, turn them into shop space. So, um, you know, you're welcome. Commissioner Gerritsen, please. So you don't get involved at all in residential development? Um, Mr. Conley and I will talk from time to time, but no, I don't work with the residential developers. They might call us. Um, they've talked about different locations, and I re will refer those conversations to Mr. Conley and his, his team. Okay. I just noticed that you didn't say residential. You said uh industrial retail yeah and we'll work with mixed use i mean we've had conversations with those folks because obviously there's the retail component as part of that uh, but if it's strictly residential those are ones that we'll refer to mr conley and his team thank you we have a question from our student commissioner um the old ralph's um market in oceanside where Oceanside. Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask if that was in Oceanside, but um, it's kind of in the middle of Vista. And do you communicate with Oceanside about, or is there like a, on the 78 Innovate plan, um, yeah. do you communicate about that and, and um, developing or doing something about that empty shopping mart? So with regard to um, the other cities, we communicate. Um, we do compete a little bit on retail, you know, so that's why it's not part of Innovate 78. Um, yeah, I got a little ribbing there when they got urge. Um, that being said, we do work together closely. And it, that was interesting because there was actually a specialty market that was going to go into the Ralph's location. Then Ralph's decided that they wanted to stay a little bit longer, which scared that specialty market away, which I think would have been really good for that location. And then they've went upside down in that location again. So um, I have not heard of anything from Oceanside staff on what's going in there lately. And I don't think that Mr. Conley has either. Doesn't look like we have any more questions. Thank you. Really appreciate the update. Thank you very much. Very interesting. All right, Mr. Conley, I guess the next is you. Our commission, staff discussion, council action reports. Uh, so no updates tonight other than the fact that we do not have a second meeting in May. The 16th is canceled. Our next meeting will be on June 6th. We'll have uh, possibly a couple items that night. Okay. Uh, your planner. Assistant Planner City Attorney, Mr. Stone, nothing. All right. Reports, comments from commission members. Commissioner Looney. John, do you have any update on Guahomi School that was going to be relocating to Melrose? So Guahomi School is still uh, pending. Um, they haven't formally withdrawn their application, but we do understand that they are looking at other options now um, as a result of the problems they had with the neighbor there at the center on North Melrose that they were looking at going in. Um, they have not resubmitted. We indicated the last time we spoke, based on a letter that we got from the neighbor, that an EIR was likely going to be required in order for them to move forward. And um, they have not come back to the table requesting to uh, do an EIR. So I think they're probably looking at other options at this point. Thanks. OK. 
Okay, next on our agenda is Planning Commission election of officers. So we have two officers that we need to um, fill positions for. One is for chairman and the other is for co-chair. And I would like to toss out uh, the possibility of uh, Commissioner Rossler stepping up. He showed his, has showed his leadership ability and has taken over for me and I think it's a natural progression. So I would like to um, throw his name out as a, as a, for chairman. Will you accept that if we agree? Uh, I'd be honored if the rest of the commission uh, uh, thinks my leadership abilities are up to it. Uh, I would like to ask if uh, Commissioner Looney would, uh, would accept vice chair and help me out running the meetings if, uh, if that's possible. You just have to bribe him never to be sick. So, um, Mr. Connolly, do we vote first on chair, or how do we proceed? So typically you will uh, um, make a nomination, get a second, and then we'll see a show of hands. Okay. Uh, I move forward to nominate um, Commissioner Rossler as chairman for the VISTA Planning Commission. Second. Seconded by Commissioner um, Jackal. Show of hands. Do I abstain? You can vote if you'd like. Okay. All right. Let's <laughs> let the record show that um, Commissioner Rossler is the new chairman of the Planning Commission. Good. You want to go? Vice chair. Um, and I'd like to move that uh, Commissioner Looney be uh, appointed as uh, vice chair. That is seconded by Commissioner um, Gerritsen. Gerritsen. You'll accept if we. <laughs> um, please, uh, show of hands if you're in favor for Commissioner Looney being our co-chair. Let the record show we have a new chairman and a new co-chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. You guys will be seated on the 6th of June, and uh, we'll have a, a uh, swearing in with the clerk. Or actually, we don't have to swear you in. You're already sworn in as commissioner, so you'll just take your seats on the 6th. Thanks. Great. Good. I, I just would like to, to mention uh how well you've done this and what an example you've set for us on how to how to run the meetings and uh just thank you for the great job you've done for uh, four, four years four years four yeah. years it's been so, a pleasure thank you uh let the record show we are adjourned at eight fifty nine.